do it. We're live. I got these cups from Guatemala. Oh, that's wonderful. And somehow I brought them here without chipping them. That's great. No, yes. they're very nice. They look very like South American, actually. Have Can you I been to South America? That? No, but I mean, I'm in the, around a lot of the culture. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's so lovely to have you on the show. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I forget where I was. I, I think I was catching a bus from one terminal to another in New York City. Why are you making that face? Oh, New York Lovely. City. Okay, I thought something terrible was happening. It's not that you have a terrible, <laughs> exasperated look on your face normally. Anyway, oh yeah, I was in New York City. Look and at that. I don't know what, if it was on Instagram or YouTube, but it was so great. Yeah, and yeah, wonderful. It's been really cool to yeah, see it. Yeah. yeah, that's, I mean, that's divine intervention right there because I'm from New York City. Nice. See that? It's like... <laughs> I First time I went to New York City, I remember thinking, I finally found a city that can keep up with me. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. And then when you leave New York City and you go anywhere else, maybe not LA, it feels like everything is in slow motion. Well, no, everything is in slow motion for me in LA. Yeah. yeah, but then I go to New York. It's too fast for me now. I'm like, I, kind of, I love that LA has <laughs> slowed you down. It has. That's how insane New York City is. If yeah. LA is slow. Yeah, like I literally go to New York City just to get my bearings back to get that like electric energy. Yeah. And then I'm like, okay, guys, it's dirty here and there's rats and it's too much. So I need to leave now. <laughs> I miss my car. But LA must be like that. Oh no. Well, what is LA like? Because when I went to LA, I remember thinking, there's no down. There didn't seem to be a downtown mm -hmm. walk friendly area. I went to Hollywood Boulevard thinking that would be somehow uh, glamorous. <laughs> I had to have three showers in the hotel when I got back. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah, uh, Hollywood. Um, actually, LA does have its walkable areas. You just have to know where they are. And, uh, but I mean, it's, it's, Los Angeles is a wonderful city sightseeing wise. Beautiful weather, beaches. You can go from the beach to the mountains to the desert yeah. in like, you know, a couple of hours, right? But it's just when you live there, there's just the things that bring it down, like the politics and that, you know, otherwise it's actually a pretty cool place. You know, I mean, I enjoy it. And uh, but to raise a family, it's not some place I would want to raise a family. I used know? to live in San Diego. OK. For th three years. Oh, OK. I used to work at Catholic Answers. If, oh, yeah, you know yeah, I mean. yeah. So I get it. Like the beach, the, the ocean. The, yeah. Well, the beach is the ocean. But the, the weather, <laughs> it was so lovely. But. But I remember going to LA and thinking, this is, why would anyone want to live here? Does a lot of it have to do with connections and I don't mean to yeah. crap on your hometown. No, no, it's not my hometown. And my hometown is, is Brooklyn, New York. So nice. I just, I'm just a transplant. But uh, I think it has to do with, you have to get to know the locals because then it's a different experience than knowing like people who came there for the industry. That's a completely mm. different dynamic, okay. you know? <laughs> And then it's just getting your bearings about your 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 every day. Like, you know, where do you go to the gym? Where do you go to church? Where do you go to, you know, what what's your what's your vibe? What do you do? You know? Mm -hmm. And I think once you find that, it's a lot easier, you know. But otherwise, it's it, LA is a it's a very can be very seedy, has a very seedy underbelly, and it's very easy to get lost in there. And I've seen a lot of people just how? Well, I mean, you have, a lot of people come there for the entertainment world, yeah. right? And the entertainment world, world is very predatory. That's why, I mean, I came out there for the entertainment world and I was like, okay, guys, I'm done with this. Really? <laughs> I'm retiring, good. Um, but it's just- when you, What do you mean? What were you trying to- I went out there for acting initially. Okay. I mean, I was a professional dancer back in New York yeah. and I'm like classically trained ballet and everything. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And so I got into acting while in New York, I got into more theater and mm -hmm. I wanted to do a little bit more film and television, probably come back to New York and start doing more Broadway stuff, right? So I came out there and I got a dance agent like right away. I didn't mean to, I just went to an audition for fun and they just like signed me on the spot. I was like, oh, here we go, you know. I was a body double for Serena Williams one time for a commercial. Sorry, say that again? I was a body double for no. Serena Williams oh, cool. in a commercial. commercial. I can't even speak. <laughs> So I did like random things yeah. and then I just, there was an interesting moment where my agent at the time, this was before Beyonce had her like big tour and I was a huge Beyonce fan at that okay. time. And she hired a lot of dancers from my old school, Alvin Ailey back in New York, a lot of Ailey trained dancers. And so they knew my background like, okay, we're gonna send you in for a private audition cause they're hiring dancers and this is like the first round picks. I should have been extremely excited. I was like, you know guys, I don't want this anymore. I just, I, it, I'm just tired. I'm tired and I just don't want it. Why were you tired? Were you doing a lot of little things? I just think I the, the, the entertainment world just started to get very disillusioned for me. It's like when I started to realize that the audition process is never ending, like you're always having to prove yourself. You're always ah. having to keep up with an image and, you know, succumb yeah. to what other people's views and desires are for you. 
just kind of like, and then no financial stability in the middle of any of this, okay. right? What were you doing for work? I was personal training. Okay. So fitness has always been in the background. So I was like, all right, guys, I'm going to go be a bodybuilder now. See you later, peace. <laughs> you know? And actually, they kept me on um, after I started competing and stuff. So that's how I got the Serena Williams job. On the spot, they hired me, like just sight and scene. They were like, oh, yeah, that girl, she's got a great body. Let's go ahead. She, you know, it looks like Serena go, go over there. Yeah. You know, but Serena was like taller than me and bigger than me, too. So it's kind of weird. But... Did they do anything to. Well, to it adjust was, for that? Yeah, well, it was just like mostly like hand and like my lower body for footwork for tennis. Mm -hmm. um, so the actually the commercial, it wasn't that raunchy, which is funny, but it, I wasn't. But the other character in the commercial was kind of like she had like a sports bra. And this is back like 10 years ago. So the... I guess it's the F, the F, FAA, F, FCA, whatever, the federal, whatever, the censor people. They're like, this is just cannot be on television. Oh. Yeah, but it was. But when you go back and look at it, it's not that bad. Yeah. The girl just had on a mid midriff. Yep. And she probably had a little cleavage, just a little. But, you know, yeah. back in the day, that's how different the media was that they saw this and they were like, oh, we can't hear that. <laughs> Whereas today, would that. Whereas today, it would have been fine. It would have been all over the place. They would put it, probably put it on the Super Bowl, you know? Which like, is nuts because 2000. Yeah, have you seen the Dolce Gabbana ads? I have not seen it, but I can imagine how oh, it must I be. I don't want to. <laughs> so, as the, so, that was what they, uh, you know. Are there many people who try to go to LA to get recognized who are doing things like this and who are even getting spots like you did mm -hmm. who then just go, no, I'm disillusioned? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, probably. I mean, it's. It, it, it's probably 50 50 because a lot of people move to LA for the opportunity. And yeah. if you're not prepared, if you don't have any connections, if you don't know anyone, then it's really hard to, to make a way in LA, especially now where social media makes chasing clout and being famous for whatever yeah. is it's like people aren't getting into it for the art. Yeah. I was there because I love to act. I loved, I love dancing. Mm -hmm. I was there for the art, not to become famous. Right. But to see what I had to do just to pursue the art and how I had been hit on and this, I was just like, I'm not coming out here for the casting couch. I really don't want to do this. So it's just kind of like. That's, that's a, so that's a real thing on oh, all levels. Oh, yeah, of... absolutely. And I just felt like I didn't want to sacrifice my integrity and my morals just for a, a gig. And then I, um, but I also had fitness already in the undercurrent. And I knew that I could go forward with that and have a lot more fun on my terms as far as like making money and doing what I love and just, you know, cause I've always known, I've known very many things as I was a precocious child. Mm -hmm. I just knew that like somehow, like whatever it was that I would survive to like live in the world, that it would be things that got, that were inspired by the talents that God gave me, you know? So fitness was a really great talent of mine dancing. Like, and I had all this idea to inspire people. So that's kind of where it all fell in place. Mm. You know, that must take courage to be like, you know what? I'm done. Yeah. Especially if you're fine, if, if you're getting any kind of attention. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was more, it was scary because I felt like more, I was more worried about being seen as a failure mm. in the arts. You know, did I fail? Did I quit? Mm. You know, and uh, oh, well. So, okay. So you grew up in Brooklyn? Yes. In a Catholic family? I did. Did you, I go, did. To, did you go to mass? And Oh, did I go to mass? Man, I was at mass every day. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Because of school? Or yeah, well, you're... yeah, because I was in Catholic school since kindergarten yeah. all the way through college. I graduated from Fordham University, okay. of all places, right? Yeah. So complete Catholic education. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when you're, in, when you're in Catholic school as a kid, you got daily mass, you got the nuns. I had nuns. Nice. Okay. I did had they the have whole, habits? I had some habit nuns as well. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So it was that whole experience. And, um, yeah, I mean, my faith has always been centered to my life. My mm. mother to me has been one of the most holy people that I ever know. And, you know, it's just like, um, I had a very complicated, um, upbringing. Like it's very, it's a long story, but I was raised by my godmother's family. So, mm. but she, to me has always been one of the holiest women that I ever just praying constantly, always in, you know, going to mass and stuff like that. And it just reading scripture, like I never thought that I could measure up. Like, I was just like, wow, like, you know? Um, so it's funny that today I'm kind of like yeah. that way. It's like, well, how did that happen? You know? So. What, is, what is her opinion of your YouTube presence? Oh, and... she's so delighted. Oh. Absolutely. My whole family, you know, cause I, my whole family is pretty religious actually, you mm -hmm. know, I've got some pastors and you know, people in the church and just, you know, and when I say that, I mean like more Protestant, but mm -hmm. everyone is so proud and so happy and just like so supportive. So that's, 
That's one of the good things. So when you say God was kind of the center of your life always, mm -hmm. did, was there ever a reversion? That was my experience, right? When I was 17, mm -hmm. I kind of ex encountered the person of Jesus Christ and it ruined my life in the best, <laughs> best possible way. Um, did you have anything like that? Yeah, I did actually. Like, um, So I grew up my whole life as like this, you know, good girl and you know all i did was go to ballet class and band practice after school <laughs> like mm -hmm. literally it's all i did <laughs> i like i didn't date and you know, didn't go out with boys i went to all girls school so like mm -hmm. where there were never any boys around anyway no so you know <laughs> yeah. so like uh I, I was actually discerning becoming a nun at some point in mm -hmm. in in high school like i was really like i love god and i think i want to be a sister but then i wanted to be a ballet dancer more so i wanted <laughs> to become a ballerina and so uh, after I went to college, of course, now you're out of the environment that fosters all of this like Catholicism and like morality. And now you're in the arts world where mm -hmm. everything is just like free and just like, you know, this. And I didn't get taken up into it in a crazy way at all. But mm -hmm. it was just like I stopped going to mass. Mm -hmm. You know, I stopped really doing the things that put me in practice with my faith. And but I never stopped believing. Right. I also encountered the discussion like, oh, you're a Catholic, like that's evil. Like the the Pope is a reptilian. Like what are you, what are you doing? Like mm -hmm. black people aren't Catholic. So I'm like, okay, world, what do you have to offer? Show me what, do you, what, what religions do you have? Let me go explore and see what that's all about. So I kind of was doing that for a while. And then- um, And so, in New York City, so there's a lot of options on oh, the table. Tell me about it. I mean, they stand on the street corners like yelling at you basically, you know, if you're not a part of that. And that's the, the Hebrew Israelites. That's a whole oh, other yeah, thing. Yeah. But anyway, um, yeah. So I, I had a reversion experience in a way because there was a point maybe about, about five years ago now where I started having that call. Is this while come, you were in LA? While I'm in LA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This call to just come on back. Like, all right, there's like, I should start going to church again. Like, you know, I should really like start, there's just something on my heart. So of course it's like, why would I be a Catholic though? Because Catholicism is so and so evil. So let me go to this church in mm -hmm. LA. And a lot of my friends come from um, the Kojic church, the church of God in Christ, which is a very large um, black uh, church. Mm -hmm. Very well known. I mean, they, 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 their services are fantastically amazing. I just, I mean, out of full respect, I mean, I did get some spiritual food out of that. Yeah. And especially like the gospel music. Oh, oh my gosh. They've got some of the best gospel in the world. Really? You know, they gotta look these people oh, up. Oh man, like um the Clark sisters who are a major, like a major gospel group and artists themselves, they come out of that tradition and like just a bunch of people. So, you know, I'm in that service, like, okay, got yeah. the news. But there was a experience that I had where we were having communion. And you know, they start passing the plate around and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And everyone takes the the host and the, well, it's not really a host, but just the wafer and the the juice thing and they pop it open and everyone takes the communion at the same time. And I'm sitting there like, oh no, like this isn't it. Interesting. Yeah. I was like, like, I know what the Eucharist is and this isn't it. So it just felt at that moment for me, like, okay, you you gotta go back home. So I found myself wow. at my current parish <laughs> and I've never turned back. Wow. Yeah. And, yeah. and do you have a, is a good local parish? Oh, man. Because it could be dangerous, right? Like yeah. you leave this wonderful, powerful environment, you go to the closest parish near you, it could be hit or miss. Right. Well, right. I it was a hit and it was by the grace of God. I had heard of, my, my parish is Good Shepherd in Beverly Hills. Um, okay. And I had heard of, heard of this parish because of a friend of mine way back in New York when we were talking about our faith and they were from L.A., and he was like, oh, you're Catholic, I'm Catholic too. What church you go to, blah, blah, blah. And they told me about the church that they went to where they you know, were part of out in LA. So that name always stuck to me. <clears throat> and it so happened that they weren't, they weren't too far from me distance wise, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, first thing I did, I was there. And I think what drew me to know that I was in the right place, because by this point, we're getting into like, I think I, think I just started going like right before before the pandemic really started. And you know, LA was on like, we were on the worst lockdown in the country, okay? Like, I guess, I know, yeah. I, I, what was that like? Oh, it was prison. It was great at first, cause you know, it's like, oh yeah, you know, I'm gonna bake some cookies at home and I got my plants and I'm doing all this stuff. And then it's just like, I'm gonna die, you know? Yeah. So, but Especially was, as you probably got the sense that other parts of the country were lifting restrictions. Well, I mean, 
that's the thing. Like when you're living in the LA bubble, you're getting mm. the you're getting one side of the bubble. So it's mm-hmm. like you know we have to what they say squash the curve, whatever they were saying about the curve, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. put the, the curve out, curve. whatever it yeah. was, yeah, whatever nonsense. I don't know. Like stay in your house. Everybody in New York is doing it. You know, everybody's staying in the house. Get in the house. You know, uh-huh. look at those people in Florida. They're gonna get sick and die. And of course, all the entertainment <laughs> industries is are in these far come from these far left places. So if you're watching television, yeah. you're also hearing. Yeah, it it's there. like get in get in your house. We're all in our house. You know, in our mansions in the hills. <laughs> you know, whatever. Yeah. It's cool, right? No. Anywho, so I it was at that time that I actually started to watch. Um, the masses online from the parish, but also I started watching Father Mike. And oh, his, yeah, I was oh. like, I was into his, you know, you know, mass services as well. So mm. the moment they let us free, you know, and I, and I make it, I, I make fun of it. It's like, um, it's like they give us a free, they give us a free, like, like we were freed slaves in the, you know, okay. <laughs> in California. So <laughs> the moment we were set free, yeah. I'm running to Good Shepherd mm. and we still had all these restrictions and all the stuff. And the thing that really set my heart, like this is the place to be, was our our pastor, Father Ed Minioff. He had come in in the procession. He was the only one because they he could, there was no procession. There was like no no altar service, no altar, no nothing. Right? It was just him coming in, and it was the first time in years I'd seen a priest lay prostrate on the floor on Good Friday. Just boom! I was mm. like, oh, this is home. I am not leaving. Are you kidding? So it was just a moving, moving, moving time for me, and so I've been there ever since. The next year I um, did RCIA as a sponsor. Okay. And that was really like edifying for me. And now I am there. Um, I'm one of the coordinators with our young adult young young adults group. Nice. And so I have a very active role within our parish community. So it's it's home to me, you know. And and, and this is coming from someone who actually loves traditional Orthodox Catholicism, because mm-hmm. that's what I that's what I grew up with. Okay. You know, the smells and the bells, like that's what I know. Mm-hmm. And so um, I love the Latin mass and I would love to attend one on a weekly basis. However, um, my call within my parish is so strong mm-hmm. that I kind of just park at home there. And I go to TLM with, you know, a very close group of uh, friends of mine who I consider family. We like to go there maybe like once a month or so. Um, but yeah, so it is funny to see what has become cool in Catholicism, if you want to put it that way, just from a strictly crass secular way of looking at the church, uh-huh. right? Like, I felt like back in the 90s, it was just pianos and drums and things like that. <laughs> and maybe that was what some young people wanted, but I don't know anybody who is under 50 who wants that anymore. Maybe that's just yeah. my bubble, right? Maybe there are people who do want that. <coughs> yeah. But even yeah. those people, I feel like, are really drawn to the reverence and the silence. And Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, I think it de- might depend on a number of things because I can say that growing up in my parish in Brooklyn, I grew up at St. Xavier's Is it a beautiful physical church structure? Yeah. My, my childhood experience is very... Okay, do you know Sesame Street? Everybody knows Sesame sure. Street. So yeah. it's, it's Sesame Street is based on like a conglomerate of different Brooklyn specific uh, neighborhoods. And yeah. I grew up in one that was kind of like a Sesame Street. Like I grew up in Park Slope, okay? Yeah. Per, very Petersk trees, you know, in the park. Mm. And in the middle of of the the par- of the neighborhood is this this church, St. Xavier Church. And it's got the elementary school. That's where I went to elementary school. They have St. Savior High School. I went to Cathedral High School in the city. Mm-hmm. Graduation was at St. Patrick's Cathedral. Did oh, you yeah. believe Been that? There, Amazing. Of course. Yep. So my experience in growing up in this parish, first of all, is very Italian, very, very Irish and Italian. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I grew up with the Irish and Italian Catholics. And we had just very reverent masses. Like I was speaking to um the pastor at our church, Father Ed, one day. I was like, you know, I remember, I don't know why I have this vivid memory of the monstrance? Like we had this huge monstrance in mm-hmm. our church and they used to always bring it all the time. They had the incense going, mm-hmm. you know, bells, the, the holy water. It was just an experience. When you walked into that church, it just the smell, the environment, the smokiness, it just took you to this other world place. You knew you were in the house of God, right? And for me, that's what's missing in a lot of churches nowadays that are within the, you know, the Novus Ordo kind mm-hmm. of tradition. Um, so, I grew up with all of these memories of kind of this, like it was just like the straddling the line, I think, of the major changes that would happen because we're still coming off the brunt end, like mm-hmm. maybe 20, 25 years after Vatican II really went into like a full effect. Mm-hmm. So our parish, I think, was still catching up. There's a lot of old people there that were veiling and just like mm. doing the thing, you know? 
So we had like some masses where they had like the guitars out and it broke out in pandemonium. Like, what are these guitars doing here? Oh, really? what are these? Like, so it's mm -hmm. like, as a young person, I'm just kind of like, okay, whatever. <laughs> I don't care. It's just like, I'm here for God. I don't care. Mm -hmm. So I think now in my later years, I see the beauty in the traditionalism. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm not the guitar mask girl. Mm -hmm. I'm really not. But I can understand how there may be some people that do connect with yeah. that if they did not experience it. I think mm -hmm. once they experience something different, then it might wake them up to like, whoa, like this is like full on like Catholic tradition. This is really what I've been missing. So for yeah. me, it feels like as the world seems at least to have grown increasingly secular and pagan and our, our sacred spaces have shrunk and shrunk. Mm -hmm. When I go to a sacred space, I need it to be different. Amen. I want to go somewhere and kiss the earth and yes. thank God for his blessings. Amen. And if I go somewhere and we dress the same as we do out there and we speak the same and we speak just as loud and we have music kind of like what we listen to, but way inferior. Uh, and, and if the jokes are from the pulpit, but they're not even that funny, right. I just like, I, I want something different. I feel like there's a lot of people who are more and more like that. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you were in LA, um, how, like, I know you said it was that moment with communion, mm -hmm. but, and then you said you were listening to Father Mike, how important did say Catholic YouTube or help in your reintegration into Catholicism? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it was an important, very integral part of it because at that point, I just think I was just craving something like deeper, you know, uh, at that, it, it, it became like, I just wanted to know more about my faith. Like it's one thing to be catechized as a child mm -hmm. and to learn all these things like religion classes, like from the time you're in kindergarten till like whatever the, your last schooling. And it's interesting because when I was in college, I was in the dance program. So our dance program is with the Alvin Ailey American Dance Center. And that's like one of the leading modern uh, companies and schools in the world, right? So I think, oh man, I'm gonna get lambasted for this. I think that Fordham kind of had to do some kind of a deal with the devil <laughs> with, 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 the, with the dance department because we were not required to take any theology classes at Fordham University, mm -hmm. okay? And then we were also at the Lincoln Center campus, but most of our classes were happening in the studio. So when I had my academics, I was in the actual Fordham building, but mm -hmm. my dance classes were all in the dance studio, which I don't, you know, listen, that's what I got there for. But my theology stopped at that point, mm -hmm. right? So I had been catechized though from kindergarten to 12 at least. But you forget all that stuff when you're an adult, you know, you really do. And so, and then the things are just, I needed that faith for that adult faith formation. I needed to go deeper. I needed to find specific answers to things that I had on my mind or mm -hmm. wanted to know even more. It's almost like for me, it was like the head knowledge had to connect with the passion Amen. and my personal life. Right. I had to make it my own. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. And so um, I had found like Catholic Answers. Mm. I found Trent Horn. I found nice. you. Yeah. I found like, and then, I mean, I have to stop and say for for one person who was very instrumental in all of this is dina from a catholic wife i don't know who that is oh you don't know who that is i need to oh well, listen i just shouted her out honey yeah, you need to go find her yeah, yeah, yeah. she's fantastic <laughs> dina barca from a catholic wife she is yeah. one of the women that i found when i was looking into veiling mm. and she had spoken so well of it I'm look it up <laughs> sorry could you how do you spell dina D E E N A. Dean is getting a shout out. Yeah, right. She deserves a shout out. Good. B A R C A. Uh huh. A Catholic wife is her channel. Right, we'll put the, yeah, we'll put her in you. the description. Yeah. Right. <laughs> is this live? Yeah. Oh wow. Hey, I'm ready. <laughs> Blabbing away. I didn't even know we were live. It's like, hey, are you kidding? I don't know what's going on. I, I said, listen. Never mind. <laughs> I listen never mind. here. Did you just think we were about no, to go I didn't live? No, what was going on? I thought we had the countdown and like. That's you know, a good thing though. Well, you know, that's what you thing. want. That's, that, what that's makes... why in the beginning I was kind of talking really quiet like this because uh, I wasn't sure what was going on. I was like, oh, wait a minute, I think we're live. Let me sit uh, up straight I'm so here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I gotta be more. <laughs> Okay. Sorry, I thought I said, and we're live. <laughs> I obviously, listen, Yo, let me drink my coffee out of the straw. It. This is my little thing, guys. Don't be, don't be weirded out. Yeah. <laughs> so this, yeah, this is not, this is not the first time this has happened. I have had a conversation before and about 20 minutes in, someone said, sorry, are we, are we live? I'm like, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. I figured something was I had this, I had this thought that, um, I don't know, like uh, big introductions on podcasts are, <laughs> 
uh, kind of like the 10 minute introductions to movies back in the 80s. Yeah. You know, you'd sit through it. You're like, why is Yeah, it's not necessary, actually. Why are we? I just, you know. <laughs> it's not necessary. And it's also not good for YouTube. They want you to actually That's start right. right away. There so, you go. There Boom. you go. So. Well, it's just so people know, we have your link to your excellent channel in the uh -huh. description. Fantastic. Oh, Hold on. No, I put it in there. Yeah, no, I just I just realized I put the, the shout-out channel above Roxy's channel, and that's probably no, not no, kosher. No, let's put that at the very bottom. <laughs> Getting close there. Um, so let's see here. So yeah, you a, go a by that black, ca that black Catholic chick. Yes, that black you Catholic chick. You have 8.69 thousand. All right, gang, okay. here's what we need. By the end of the week, <laughs> I need to see this at at least 10,000 subscribers. <laughs> So, Come on over for the shenanigans, guys. Yeah, <laughs> click the link, head there over, are subscribe. There are lots of shenanigans <laughs> on my channel. You have okay. no idea. <laughs> you have no idea. I, I'm tamed, okay? You guys have no clue. I edit out a lot. Let me stop. <laughs> All right. But yeah, what was... Okay, so that Dina lady Yeah, so and like others. she... Uh, I When I had was really getting that deep call to Veil, I found mm. a video that she had done, like an interview or something like that. And then I followed her channel. And that was very instrumental for me. And I mean, the reason why... I, I It's... It's funny because you watch people online and then you kind of, when you're always in the comments, <coughs> you're, you know, commenting on things they say, you kind of build a little rapport, yeah. right? Yeah. So when I, when my first video, well, this is the joke. This is the running joke. The video that most people saw, which is like, I'm a black woman, this is why I'm Catholic. Mm -hmm. That was like the second video. The first video was like a random short I threw up there like months before. Like, mm -hmm. just like, hey, 25 people watched it. That's great. Wonderful. Yeah. But she had seen that second video, the official first um, and she shared it on her network, on her channel. Oh, and cool. so like, it was after that point that, you know, the algorithm started picking things up. You saw it and then you shared it on yours. And just like, you know, she was really instrumental. So her oh, channel was really great. And awesome. then um, uh, Christopher West, oh my mm. gosh, love, tell love, me, love. Tell me why. Because theology of the body just makes sense yeah. on so many levels. Mm. And when I connected it to fitness, Oh man, I am just shouting from the rooftops like, guys, you got to hear this. Right, tell me, <laughs> tell me about this. Because then what we're going to do is we're going to send this to Christopher so he can watch it. So tell us about this connection between. So, I mean, again, it was, it was a call for me to get deeper in faith. And one of the things, I'm a single woman. Hi guys, I'm single if you're looking for, you know. Okay. A young Catholic match? Because last time, Thursday crapped all over Catholic match and complained about it. But we put him in his place and he started one up. I still think I hold my opinions. I'm just using the service despite my objections. As a mercenary, well, I'm there for a woman. See, so there you go. Go find Thursday. But could we get you an account, or you don't like the idea of online? Okay. Okay. So okay, I'm in Los All Angeles. Right, let's people. go. Let's okay, go there. So let's get to the real deal here. I'm in LA. Okay. Yeah. So first of all, there are not very many. Okay. Let's go back. There are Catholics in LA. They're all Sino Catholics. Like it's like a you know like Girl, Catholic what? in name only. Okay. Sino. 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 Ah, cool. Never <laughs> heard Sinos. Of it. No. Like Rhino Republican in name only. Okay. Okay. So yeah. I don't really know what that is random. either. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. R I N O. Yeah. Exactly. Republican in oh, name only. Oh, that's what that means. Right. Rhinos. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I call them Sinos, right? Ah, Catholic love name. It. So it's like cultural Catholics, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know. <laughs> This is a long story, Matt. Listen. Well, this is a long form show. <laughs> so you say as much as you want. <laughs> it's like, like uh, I am unapologetically Catholic. Like, and I believe in all the Catholic things. Like, mm -hmm. I believe I'm pro life. You know, what? yeah, Sorry. like, okay, like, <laughs> I go to mass, I pray, I mm. like, you know, I, I'm not afraid to profess about Jesus Christ here, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm expecting a man to have a similar walk. You know, it doesn't have to mm -hmm. be identical, but it's important, right? Yeah. And if you're looking for a marriage, it's like, you have to understand what that means, particularly as Catholics or, you know, from a, from a Catholic standpoint. What does it mean to love your wife like Christ loves the church? What does it mean to respect and submit to your husband? Like, mm -hmm. and I had to explore all of that as a single woman, first mm -hmm. and foremost. So coming across Christopher West's work and what he did with Theology of the Body, it just made everything make sense. Why sex is important, why it's sacred, why it's, why, you know, I mean, you you know that fornication is wrong, but why? Yeah. What's the reason behind it and yes. how can it be better, right? So when I started to discover all of this stuff and started to really read the scripture and see where, how many times, like the Bible is so corporal. It's so corporal from the beginning to end. 
when God created Adam, mm-hmm. he breathed life into his essence, into his body, right? His body to make him come alive. He took Eve from his the side of his body. Everything, we got, Christ gave up his body. We're asked to pray with all of our bodies. There's so much corporalness to, to prayer. And I'm like, man, we're going through fitness, being sold lust, look sexy, mm-hmm. attract the right mate, you know, all of this outward stuff. Do we, you know, get in shape to feel better, to 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 look good, ego, vanity, right? All of these things that were sold in fitness are actually being twisted up into our vices. And that's why people are not able to stay on on track with it. It's like if if everything that matters to being in shape is all superficial or it's all linked to like how just the appearance, right? Although there are some people who do it for health, but let's go even deeper. How can we connect this spiritually? When you finally get that, then you start to see people, my clients are able to change their bodies and keep that change for the long term because we're mm. changing their mindset, their habits, their behaviors, their patterns, and even their connection spiritually with so many of them. So the theology of the body work that I started to go into from the standpoint of looking at it at one thing turned into this whole other thing that I'm so excited to profess about. It's like, so let me simplify it so I can see if I understand it. Are you saying like <laughs> there's this difference, like in the secular world, often it's like, uh, get in shape so you can look hot. Yeah. And you're saying, no, there's a new way of looking at it as where it's like, get, treat your body as a temple of the Holy Spirit Amen. because of your dignity or something like that. Right, is that exactly, the, okay. exactly. And like, <clears throat> I started to, um, like when I go into my own workouts, because there was a point for me, even being a professional bodybuilder, even, you know, and I, I competed at the highest level. I cannot wait money. to talk about that because <laughs> that is so far removed from my existence yeah. or my experience. And that's an interesting thing because it's all vanity, right? And it's highly lustful, but that's a whole thing. We'll talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah. We'll save that we'll for the there. second half. You yeah. Know? Okay. But um, so like. T.O.B. <laughs> Back to T.O.B. Yeah. <laughs> right. So the thing is that we. Where am I going? I forgot. <laughs> well, I, I interrupted you. I'm sorry, but it's this idea of like we. You said it was helping your clients as you took this. Different- right, because you just think of things in a different perspective. It's like again, it's instead of looking at how can I be better for the exterior to just look good, feel better, look good, and all that stuff. How can I do this for life? I'm going to have this one body until the day I die. Mm -hmm. I can decide for myself if I'm going to go into the grave sliding in in the best health that I could have been at hopefully 90 something, 100 something years old, (laughs) or I'm going to go into that, into that grave decrepit and broken and you know in all these things that don't some of it's outside of your control let's just let's put that out there some people have illness and it's Mm -hmm. not your fault Mm -hmm. but even still how can we get to you to a point that's your normal that makes you mobile that makes you feel amazing but also how can you do all of this through christ especially when you have chosen to follow in his ways so how can we connect this to you and that's kind of like what my inspiration is yeah and the catholic view that you are your body Mm-hmm. is somewhat alien, I think, to the secular culture's understanding, mm-hmm. which is basically you have a body maybe. Right. You know, and what you do with your body, therefore, may may matter, but it may not because it's not the real you. Mm-hmm. But if I am my body, then it starts to make sense that if I begin to treat it better, then mm-hmm. it's going to affect my moods. It's going to affect how yeah. I think and study and pray. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I keep coming back to a specific scripture. I have a lot of scriptures that are my favorites, but um, when I was at my lowest point, and I think that's what I was connecting, mm and this kind of like ties it all together. There was a point during the pandemic where I just lost my mojo to to work out. Like I just couldn't do it. I, I I was on the East Coast. I was isolated from my family. You know, they're in New York City. So I'm in LA. We're in these two lockdown places. Can't do nothing, right? Mm-hmm. And so at my I started to feel really like isolated, anxiety, depression, all these things, you know, because I'm, I'm a social person, especially in the gym. It's like, that's why I live in the gym. I'm always there, you know, mm. couldn't go to my places and do my, my debauchery, you know, around the gym. Not debauchery, I mean, like, you know, I mean, throwing over on the ways. <laughs> Nothing bad, guys. I mean, okay. this was shenanigans, shenanigans, sure. see? shenanigans. So like, you know, just, you know, doing my workout thing. But, it, and I couldn't get out. So it just really was like, oh man, I just got really depressed. But what, what I found was um, John 15, the vine keeper. Yeah. And again, it became so corporal. It's like thinking about living, Christ living in you and you living in Christ, right? And just like what that means, internalizing him in in every way, shape and form, even in working out. And now before I train or while I'm training, like um, I pray the rosary during my cardio. Actually, innovative Roxy here. I've got 
rosary like um, prayers that I've that I've created. I'm yeah, dropping them that. on my yeah, dropping have them on my channel. Have you released videos about this? Okay, or you're about one. To, okay. There's a second one that's already ready to go, but I didn't have that time to edit it. I'll so, see that this week. <laughs> so what's the idea behind it? The scriptural rosaries is what yeah, I saw. So, yeah. So okay, I always have a story. <laughs> Every, everything I do in my life is connected that's to good. like I still have a story. Yeah. So like okay. So of course, you know, what did our what what did our lady tell us to do at Fatima? What did she say? She said to do what? Pray the rosary. Every day. Right? So I realize, and then I'm watching Taylor Marsh. She's like, if you're not praying the rosary, you're not on the team. I'm like, I gotta get on the team. Yeah. I wanna be on the team. I wanna be on the team. I wanna be on the team. He's so weird on the team. I get on the team. So like uh around summer of last year. Once again, uh, my my good friends and uh, let me just name them Michelle and Alois and Mark. They're uh, a family unit, daughter and, and her mom and her step her stepdad. Uh, we started praying the rosary in our parish. It wasn't even anything. It was something that we did together mm. before the you know the ten a.m. mass because that's where we go. We go into the little Mary garden, pray the rosary, and then. Um, go to mass together. And we extended this to the whole parish for everyone to come pray the rosary with us, 9, 15 a.m. And then mm -hmm. we go. So the rosary became an integral part for me to start off my entire week and just to start doing every single day. And that for a while I was using the Hallow app. Now listen, Hallow does not sponsor me. But they do sponsor just, this episode though. So this is really helpful so actually. Hallow.com slash Matt <laughs> Go get yourself some Hallow today. So, but, but it was very much like, I love Hello, by the way. Mm. And so I love the daily rosary. And I would normally do it while I would take a walk and stuff. But then when I started to get, again, the corporal fitness and the, mm -hmm. how bringing Christ in, and I'm listening to the Hello app, I'm trying to do a little cardio. I'm like, eh, I need a beat, you know, I need a little nice. something. Yes, so yes. The first yeah, you don't want a soothing voice while yeah, you're trying yeah, to work exactly. out. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, I need a <clears throat> But when it's the rosary that we do on Sundays in my parish, like we take turns of who heads it. And when I head mine up, I like to do a little scriptural rosary. I like to, you know, we usually pray the, the glorious, of course, mm -hmm. on a Sunday. But then I like to find like little pieces of scripture that would inspire, you know, yeah. to go along with. So I took that idea. I dropped one on the channel and then I was like, I need a fitness one. So I created a fitness one. Oh man, I've been listening to that for like, it's been like maybe two weeks now, but it has been fantastic. So I can do my cardio. It's got like this, like uh, very Lord of the Rings kind of like, you know, like How classical. Cool. Like, Is it on your YouTube channel now? Well, it'll be on there on Friday or something right. when I finally put the video together. But the All audio right. is in my member section. So you get a member section hey. <laughs> the channel. But like, um, yeah, so I just really got into the habit of that. And then. Uh, oh, that's really cool. Yeah. So it's would it been be amazing. kind of music that you might work out to anyway, but you just. Well, I am going to, I'm, I have the idea to create a different, like one. So there, there versions. are ones that are like for regular prayer. Like the mm -hmm. one that's on my channel right now, it's to like some royalty free, like Gregorian chant, yeah. like music that I found. It's just very like surreal and angelic and all that. Very Catholic. It's yeah, very yeah. amazing. But then I was like, my fitness people, listen, we got to do the rosary during the during your cardio, guys. So here's mm -hmm. your fitness rosary. And all of the scripture is like, you know, all the corporal ones that I really love. Like, you know, worship God with all your body. You know, I beat my chest like it's a slave. And like, it's so amazing. Like mm -hmm. Romans 12, 1, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I forget, it's a bunch that I picked. Um, so... It just really like fires you up, but connects you to Christ. And then the music for this one is the Lord of the Rings, kind of like really epic, yeah. dramatic, mm -hmm. classical. But then I'm going to do one that's like, you know, that has a little bit of a rock. This is going to be a little yeah. bit. And it's royalty free music. So it's sure. not like there's any like secular like mm -hmm. lyrics. There's no lyrics. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, so it it's just, just a... it works. Okay. So you've got this music pumping <laughs> in the background and then you've also got the scriptures, but are you saying Hail Mary? And, Amen. It's a rosary. And then are you, yeah, that's what, fair enough. And then are you pausing between each Hail Mary to say the scriptures or are you saying at the beginning of each decade? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a usually like, <laughs> so right where you would announce the, the mystery, yeah. then I would, I would announce the mystery, How read the scripture. How cool is that? Then your All Father's Hail Mary, you know, all that, all, all That's everything. a wonderful idea. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I meet these people who are better than me and they go on runs and they say they'll go on a rosary run, stuff like that. Yeah. I always wanted to be that cool. Yeah. But the idea of doing that and you've got this kind of motivational yeah. rosary taking place. I yeah. love it. You know, I, I prayed for God to just work through me. And this is the funny thing about how all of this started, because yeah. I did not plan a Catholic channel, guys. <laughs> The fact that I'm here is crazy, okay? Because I didn't plan for this at all. Uh -huh. What I prayed for. And it's like, God, you plan, God laughs, right? That's mm -hmm. what they say. 
So I was like, all right, I'm feeling really like disconnected from my fitness stuff because now I'm really starting to move away from the vanity of it all. I'm really starting mm. to distance myself from 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 bodybuilding itself as a sport. And there was a part of me that thought at one point that I needed to get back into it to get my mojo back. Yeah. I actually went to our pastor and I asked him, I was like, you know, I'm having some conflicts because I can't compete in the division I used to be because I'm too small and I won't use steroids. So there's this other division called bikini that I would be good for, but it's very immodest and I just don't feel comfortable with it. So we had a conversation about that and I decided I didn't want to do that, right? So I needed something. So I prayed. What was his advice to you? I mean, he, he told me I should do a, you know, maybe you can do something that's really inspiring. Mm -hmm. And he, and he's into bodybuilding and fitness. He'll tell okay. everybody. I wrote a diet for him. Okay, Father Ed, I'm going to out you right now. <laughs> wrote a diet for him and he tells everybody I'm his client. <laughs> and he's like, all right, he's my client. He's like, that's my coach. Okay. He don't be following that diet. Not all the time. I'm like, Father Ed, <laughs> he's like, I got, you know, everybody invites him out to dinner. He's like, oh, you see this belly? I got to go to dinner. And I'm like, yeah. you couldn't get the steak and salad? You yeah. No? Okay, cool. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. You know? But um, his advice was that I should, um, you know, if it's, if it's definitely like, obviously it's, it's moral conflict. I mean, he's, he's very straight laced. Like you would think this guy in the middle of like Beverly Hills with like sugarcoat stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh no. I mean, he's, he has a way of delivering mm. God's message in a way that's just straight down the plane. And isn't that what we want? Yeah, like absolutely. It, like you as a coach, your clients don't want you to sugarcoat things. Right. They want you to say things because you believe that they can be better. And right. don't we want that from our priests? A absolutely. And that's why, that's why, that, that's why I really like have such a great respect for him because mm -hmm. it's like, it's, it, I can only imagine how tough it must be to pastor in the middle of Los Angeles, right? <laughs> Where it's like, people want that, like, you know, that easy Catholicism, you know, but he's like, look, the church is pro-life. So um, Jesus Christ, this is what we do, you mm -hmm. know, and he has no qualms in saying certain things. And so I really respect him for that. And he does it in the most understanding, compassionate way. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're having this conversation. Of course, he's like, well, look, you know, <laughs> you know that this is like admonish, you know, this isn't really something that you probably should be doing. He's like, you know, maybe you can channel it and do maybe a photo shoot or something like that. That may be very tasteful, very modest and mm -hmm. still give you that satisfaction of achieving something. So I, I considered it and I took it to prayer. And so um, instead what happened was my whole fire started to really get up with the scriptural connection with, with fitness. And so that's kind of where that led to. But um, yeah, I mean, I keep losing track of what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, but, but you, so you had that fitness channel. That was the first oh, thing yeah. you had. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So I didn't pray for this. Um, I prayed that Lord, the Lord would just simply inspire me. I, I just kept saying, I kept reading John 15. So I said, mm. I just need you to speak to me, speak through me to your people. Whatever it is that you want me to put out there, that's what I need you to just inspire in me. And I'll just do it. You know, I'm, I'm at your, I'm the, ha I'm the handmaid in the Lord is my favorite thing. I am the handmaid in the Lord. Mm. Do with me as you will. Right. So. I prayed that and then I put that video up on the on my second channel and it blew up. My my Catholic channel, that black Catholic chick, was initially supposed to be a place where I talked about spiritual fitness. Who knew, right? So I created this thing, the four pillars of fitness in my fitness business. You're, like in order for you to truly be able to get to the, your best physically, your best health, you have to consider the four pillars, your physical fitness, which is something that everybody does, right? But then there's your mental fitness, your emotional fitness, and your spiritual fitness. Now I'm highly aware that on my fitness channel, which is a more, of course, secular channel, right? That I have people of all walks of life on there. And boy, were they very vocal, some of them, about when they found out I was Catholic. Oh mm. man, I got a lot of backlash about that, but you know. You probably also got backlash from Catholics about your bodybuilding. Probably, I get backlash you, you from everybody. Arrows from every side. Listen, I'm from Brooklyn too, so I'm so yeah. quick to pop off. I had to really learn how to like get that back. And there's some people in the audience right now. They're like, "She was mean to me." I'm like, "I'm sorry. I'm sorry." No, I don't really be am. sorry. I think. Yeah, <laughs> don't apologize. Hey, real quick. Sorry. Could you point that up at your mouth? Oh, we need, sorry. Yeah, we need more direct speech. That's why people. Love I'm sorry. You, I think. Did you guys like not hear me this whole no, time? We, no, we can just hear you. Better, it's just, yeah. yeah, it sounds better if you're Wonderful. talking to the front of it. Oh yeah, because of course I don't know how to use a microphone because I have my own channel. Why would I? Why would I do this? correctly um but yeah you you got some so what kind of things did you did they say and how did they find out so they found your other channel well your catholic channel yeah because <clears throat> well the my two channels are connected of course to like one like umbrella of a google of a google account right so it's like i have uh, my google account yeah. and then you can just open little other channels on, yeah. the, on the right so yeah. so i think what happened was 
because I had that other channel and then I opened a second channel, whoever was on the first channel, they just like, oh, she's got another thing. So the algorithm starts sending things yeah, to people, yeah. right? And I did say, you know, um, a couple of times, like, oh, guys, I have another channel over there. It's spiritual fitness. I don't know what I'm doing with it. Just go over there and join it, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so I had a bunch of people um, from my audience, which is a mixed crowd. It's an interesting crowd that I have on my fitness channel. I'm not sure if it's all people that, are necessarily into fitness based off of what they watch, mm. but it's an interesting segment. But I had a couple of folks who came over and who continue to come over to my channel who are black, who are very adamant about telling me how wrong I am for being a Catholic because black people aren't Catholics. And I'm just like, what is this? So I've, I've learned now not to argue with people. I tell you. Right? That. It's Proverbs. Yeah, we should, Don't we should argue talk about this. Fools. We should talk about stuff we've learned yeah. to do and not do on YouTube because. <laughs> There is like an initiation. Right. Like I remember at the beginning, negative comments would really shake me up mm -hmm. because you don't walk through your day encountering people who tell you that you suck. Right. I mean, maybe they shout it from a car or something. <laughs> people don't come up to you and explain to you in great detail why it is you suck right. and why it is you need to know that. Right. So when that starts happening on social media, it can be really, it can really rock you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, at some point you just have to learn to get over it. Yeah, well, I mean, I had gotten a lot of that anyway, um, being that I was into bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. So when you're when you're a woman who's into bodybuilding, whether you use any kind of performance enhancers or not, like you just look really extreme. I mean, I was super lean. I wasn't like huge, you know, I wasn't mm -hmm. like massive. I was not in any of those divisions or anything like that. But I was drawn in and just ah. like, really like lean. So you look bigger than you are. Okay. And of course, if you have like zero body fat, well, not zero, but low body fat, obviously that's not a very quote unquote feminine thing. And sure. women are not typically built like that. So it's like, oh, you know, you look like a man. And I'm like, I didn't care about any of that stuff. It's like, whatever, who cares? Like, but you talk about my faith. That's so personal. Yeah, because you, know? you did ballet, bodybuilding. So you're probably used to being judged because yeah. that's part of the thing. Yeah, it's like, yeah. bring it on. I don't care, whatever. Okay. You yeah. know, but you talk about my faith. I'm just kind of like, whoa, like mm. you're just now judging me on something that's completely false, first of all, because you know nothing about Catholicism. And then you're just being really mean about it on top of everything else and telling me that I'm stupid and all these other things. So I've learned to ignore it a bit and not engage it i think that's the number one thing you can tell when someone you yeah. can usually tell when people aren't speaking from a place of goodwill yeah yeah I, i've had um, to learn how i'm still learning i'm a work in progress yeah, listen i'm a too. sinner and mm -hmm. i just try to you know i've been in confession one too many times with the okay bless me father for i have <laughs> sinned it's been two days since my last confession because <laughs> this <laughs> gone jackass off the, right, yeah. off on somebody <laughs> so, on the internet yet again okay yeah. so like I've gotten better and now I just have decided that I've made the conscious decision. And it's funny because this is something that Dina was talking about recently on a video on a Catholic wife about, I forgot cal calamity she called, I forgot what it's called, mm -hmm. but it's when you, when calumny, it, calumny. When, when people, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's me. I really have to, and that's I already you, yeah. knew consciously, like don't even engage. Yeah. Like we already monitor the comments and actually, we recently turned, we, myself and my assistant, we turned it off because there's just so many to mo monitor. Oh, so you don't take comments on your channels? <clears throat> uh, no, I do take comments, oh. but we, at, at the beginning, I made the decision to say, okay, hold all comments for review. So that mm. way, all of this anti-Catholic, I don't want it on my channel. I just don't, like, listen, I don't it mind you. It also derails the conversation. Yeah. Like, it's okay to object or to disagree. Right. The other thing is you've got a community of people there who are coming to grow in their faith and to support Amen. each other. And you have someone come in injecting poison, then it becomes all about responding to the poison. Right. And not about and, an encouraging and not, environment. And at some point you get, you lose that tactfulness sometimes. Because mm -hmm. it's just, it, it's like... So I, I made the decision. I said, okay, we will not, we will not hold the comments necessarily, but you can, you can, there's a layer of like, you know, where they can hold potentially, you know, mm -hmm. inflammatory comments and it can be extra strict. So I put that on, Yeah. but I just made the decision. Like, I'm not going to even engage at this mm -hmm. point because I just get tired of it. How many times are you going to ask me, what do do you pray to Mary and worship? How many times do I explain this? Like, so yeah. it's like, okay, Go, I go to Trent Horn and go ask him over. There. Yeah. <laughs> go call in the Catholic answers; they'll tell you. You yeah. know, so um, I just don't engage anymore. I just can't. Yeah. It's not worth it. Not worth your energy. No, it's not. I barely, I barely look at the comments anymore. <laughs> yeah, 
But okay. They, why is that funny? Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you check them daily. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I used to, but then I, I just stopped caring. But then what happens too is you have a community of people that start responding for you. Oh yeah, see you know, that, that's so when great. People have questions about yeah, Mary or whatever. Yeah, you have, yeah. You know. I mean, I have a. I in in the short amount of time, I have really built this amazing community of folks who like support my channel, who watch my channel. I have a members section. They watch. They mm. they sign up for that and. And then here's how God blesses. Because remember, I, I pray when I was praying for him to speak through me, I was praying for my fitness stuff. I didn't mean this. I was like, <sighs> so I was praying like, Lord, just, you know, speak through me, whatever you want. You know? And then the Catholic channel started to take, take off. But now I actually have people that have watched this channel that have come by way of seeing your channel and, mm. and found me or Dina's channel found me. And then they contacted me about coaching for fitness and so i have some people that i've just uh, taken on in the last couple of weeks that have come by way of finding that my other channel and so it's just all just been so amazing just there are some amazing people out there and Mm -hmm. you can't let the few really yeah you can't let the few bad apples out there Mm -hmm. you know spoil your bunch right right so when you said people say you shouldn't be catholic because black people aren't catholic (laughs) what do they what do you what do they mean by that I mean, oh, okay. if you so, were to try to interpret that in the best possible light, what's the, let me get some <laughs> just coffee. have a little sip of that old coffee there and then. Well, now. So, okay. Um, I think that in today's time and culture, you have a lot of people, you know, a lot of black people particularly who are very much into speaking very strongly on certain social issues, number one. Uh, and number two, kind of like really finding what they feel is their stolen identity. And one of the things that they feel has been forced upon black people through slavery is Christianity, right? Mm. So to them, it's like, you know, they'll say you worship white Jesus. That's why I did that video about like me changing the, the photos in the back of me, which were originally Elizabeth Taylor, Mount Marilyn Monroe. Okay, all the Catholics are like, oh, you can't have that back there. So I was like, fine. <laughs> Fine. Everybody was listen, I'm gonna Jesus and Mary, but they're gonna be black. So I made a whole parody video on that. Okay. But like so I'm it's like, sure a lot of people didn't realize it was a parody. <laughs> no, they did. Okay. And they were of course those overly sensitive people, but uh, it's okay. It's all good. It's all I don't you know, I'm here for the fun. Shenanigans. That's right. So <laughs> that's what we're gonna, we, we clearly have to name your channel that at yeah, some I was point. Like, yeah. Black Catholic chicken shenanigans. <laughs> so like I, so there's that thing. It's like, oh, you worship white Jesus. I'm like, Jesus, you know, whatever. Anyway, so they, there's that whole thing. And then you have a lot of folks who feel that there are other religions that are more suited for us, that are more closer to what our ancestors are, that, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, is, the Hebrew Israelites believe that they are the original people of the Bible and that, you know, everybody was black in the Bible and all these things. And that if you're following Christianity, it comes from Constantine and this, not, and it's just like, all right, folks. And then, you know, you have other people who may be um, Muslim or, you know, or a lot of black people who are involved with the nation of Islam. And I have great respect for, listen, I have respect for people. I'm not going to force my beliefs on you. I'm just not. And I just really appreciate if you don't force your beliefs on me, you know, and so I get that people have their own relationship with Christianity in a way that they see it as negative, you know, they see it as oppressive and all these things, but that's not my experience. So I cannot take mm. that on and say that just because of the color of my skin or my race, that I should think a certain way, I should be a certain way, that I should, you know, see the world a certain way. And I'm not going to deny who Christ, Jesus Christ is because you're not happy with that. You know, I, I, I get a lot of flack online just because of my social avatar here, you know, being a black woman, being a dark skinned black woman, being a dark skinned black woman with natural hair. It's like, I'm supposed to walk around the world with my fist in the air, like, you know, Angela Davis and like be mm-hmm. social justice warrior over here, you know, on everything. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of, I, 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 when people find out that it's like, first of all, she's Catholic and she's like conservative and her beliefs and stuff, it's just kind of like, whoa, like this is too much. So they have to tell me about how wrong I am, how asleep I am and all this stuff. So it's this constant thing. I don't care. Listen, mm. say whatever you want. I'm not, this is, who, this is what you get. You come over here. This is what you get. You don't like it. You know, yeah. Out. Well, you know, it's funny. That means something very different in Australia, in Australia. What does that mean? So this is called, in Australia, this is called the forks and it's on par with the middle finger. <gasps> oh my God. Isn't that funny? So I was like, good for you giving them the forks. <laughs> I'm like, I should have peace. So my, my, when, when my wife and I were dating and we were at my home parish in Australia and everyone was giving the sign of the peace, my wife did this to my bishop, right? Because I don't know. 
no, no. And my bishop's like, well, that's the first time somebody's given me the forks. And, you know, <laughs> that's just Speaking fun. of, Cameron said in the chat, uh, that Cameron's those there? are her cups and please don't break them before she gets home. <laughs> I love them so much. That's I do. funny. She's watching from Guatemala. <laughs> I guess so. I yeah. saw Unless a comment someone's hacked into her. her account and spoken exactly as she would <laughs> seeing these cups. Like, There's also a very odd emoji that I've never seen before. So I feel like it has to be Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Because she doesn't know how to use emojis. No, it's just like it was. It's a, an emoji that only I think she would use. Like nobody else would find it. <laughs> oh, all right. Like, it's a compliment. It's just a weird one. <laughs> the other thing too is like none of the things that you've just said are logical. Yeah. Like to say, um, well, black people aren't Catholic, therefore you shouldn't be. Doesn't follow at all. Right. To say there's some ancestral religion that is more true to your ethnicity that doesn't follow that it's true right um to say that because you look a certain way you have to hold political beliefs mm. that doesn't follow that's either. a big one that's a big one yeah tell me more about that not being a black woman myself <laughs> right i understand the pressure and then living in la well, I mean, I think that there there are some substantial things that, are, that I think that the black community faces that are unique to our experience, particularly in the United States, let's just say black American experience, because you can't just say because the diaspora goes across, you know, mm -hmm. the entire world. But within the United States in particular, I mean, there are some issues that that people are very passionate about and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I don't know. I mean. I care about these things, but it's not, I'm, I've never been a type of person to put on a cape for anything and just like go out in the streets and march and make a big deal. It's like, if I'm going to change something, I'm going to do it in the voting booth. I'm going to do it with my money. I'm going to do it with in the ways that I can contributing to the things that will, that will create the change that I hope for, mm -hmm. you know, and the fact that I'm not so vocal about these things that I care about or that again, that they're not necessarily things that are expected of me. Yeah. I'm not expected to be, a black conservative like it, that it is talk just, about taking away someone's agency to yeah. say because you look like this you ought to be speaking like this it's oh, like yeah. how about i ought to speak the way i want to speak no oh, yeah that's unacceptable yeah and i mean i've even had i call it the, the devil's blue app it's facebook mm -hmm. <laughs> i had to get off the devil's blue app because i was always in facebook jail like <laughs> like I, listen really what were you do you mind me asking what how do you with people online mm. <laughs> about just crazy things like for instance um the other day i was telling my best friend about this there's an actress who is a you know very popular well-known black actress right now and i don't watch television i haven't watched television or i don't really watch too much like movies that much anymore mm -hmm. um but like i haven't watched tv specifically in about maybe two and a half years or so so I don't know who's out there. Okay. But I just saw a picture of a woman and Lindsay Lohan and I know Lindsay Lohan, of course, like I love all her movies and stuff. And we all know she had like a huge problem. She's gone from the media for a long Bless time. Her. Right. Yeah. But she recently came back out and this is like the first picture I've seen of her. Mm -hmm. So I said on this picture that popped up on my feed on, on the devil's blue app. <laughs> I was like, oh, I was like, I don't know who the other woman is. I was like, but Lindsay Lohan looks amazing. She looks great. She looks healthy. That well, <laughs> that let set me off tell you whatever. a firestorm. I was called out my name. I was called every derogatory name you can call a black person by other black women because of just a statement that they felt that I was undermining a black woman. I didn't know who she was. That you know I was uplifting like Lindsay Lohan. I'm just like, I just said mm. she looked good and healthy. Like my why is why are you questioning like my whole entire identity and just everything, mm. telling me I'm not black and all this other stuff just because. I said something nice about a woman of another race, mm. you know, and forget about political talk. I mean, you know, if I'm not out here saying that I feel like I'm oppressed just because I'm black and I live in America, it's just like, whoa, whoa, whoa there. Like, what do you mean? Like, you know, systemic racism and critical race theory, like you should be like all about that. I'm just like, all right, guys, what, what's for dinner? <laughs> uh -huh. Where's the nearest Starbucks? I need a coffee. <laughs> mm, yeah. So. What's happening? Oh. oh, am I am I am I messing up? The no, he does, he, so th I should have told you this. I, I should have told you that we started streaming, number one. And then I should have told you that sometimes Thursday walks around and fixes cameras while we're on stream. I'm just breaking everything, guys. I'm sorry. No, no. Yeah, that's. Yeah, things are nuts, man. Things feel so crazy. Yeah. Um, I, I think, I mean, Lent starts tomorrow. Oh, yeah. We would all do much better, I think, if we just decided to get off our political 
news feeds yeah. for Lent or social media for Lent. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it just sort of like two-dimensionalizes people, which isn't a word, right? It does. It's just like you have to be like this because you look like that, which is exactly the thing we were trying to move away from. I thought, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Now, you've had this great um, – I saw this video. I was watching it this morning about how either you changed your mind on abortion mm-hmm. or maybe you began to realize why you were pro-life. I wasn't mm-hmm. sure which, but – um, a little bit of both okay. because I've always been on the side of uh, abortion is wrong, right? Like it's just wrong. Um, I don't, it, it's, it would, and I think that it was maybe, maybe it's just, just again, like Catholic upbringing. It's like, you know, like contraception is wrong and abortion is wrong. So you don't do it. Like that. And that's, <laughs> again, you grow not up, the reason, right? Just not the, the reason it's just, it's, it's kind of what you're, yeah. tra- you're taught. So it's just like, oh, okay. Yeah. I believe that. Sure. You know? Yeah. Life is precious from cradle to the grave. Mm-hmm. Awesome. But I didn't go into the why. And then when I start to explore the why, then it made sense. Right. So I was always like, oh, I would never have an abortion because this is in the past. I would never have an abortion because it's wrong. Mm-hmm. But if one another woman did did it, I wouldn't, you know, whatever it's her business, her body, mm-hmm. her choice. You know, that was really my position for a long time. And I just, again, you start to learn the why. Why is it wrong? Why do you feel that way? Like, what's really the truth behind that? And for me, it's again kind of coming back to what do you believe about life? Right, that life begins at conception. And and everything that I understand about science, because as a personal trainer and as a fitness professional, I've studied anatomy. Kinesi- kin- kin- anatomy. Kin- anatomy. <laughs> That's what I studied. I studied kinesiology. Yes. I studied anatomy. I studied physiology. Yes. I studied the endocrine system because I just wanted to know how to help my clients in the best way, right? And so here I am faced with all of this science that I know, and I know that life begins at conception. It just does, mm. right? So at that point, it was just like, wow. We advocate for so much with abortion being healthcare, but there's also, now this is where my experience as a black woman comes in. When I started to learn about the CD history behind Planned Parenthood and Margaret Sanger and what Mm -hmm. her actual ideals were in presenting it to the black community, how she did that, I was like, how could I support Spell that out a little bit for those who are watching who may not be unaware. You don't have to be an (laughs) expert on it, but what what are you referring to? Well, it's interesting because they denied it for a long time. Planned, planned, planned Parenthood denied mm-hmm. Margaret Sanger's past as a eugenicist, mm-hmm. right? And it, in, I think during the pandemic, because this did not make the news as much as it should have, but the New York location in specific had her name on the outside of Planned Parenthood. They removed it because of her past. Like it, they could not hide it, right? Mm-hmm. So they had to remove it. So it tells you a lot about what she was really all about. She was a eugenicist. She, you know, was about, they were about exterminating black people or people that were disabled, people that were just not the shiny examples of put, passing on their genes with hum, for humanity. So she used black leaders. She went into the churches. She went into communities to really push this message forward that, hey, this is healthcare. You know, you live in poverty, this, that, the other. Like, you should probably, like, you know, think about this as women's healthcare. Mm-hmm. You don't want to bring children into this world that you can't take care of, Right. So then that when you look at the numbers and what that did years later, why are black women um, the leading number of abortions when it comes to these procedures in the nation? Right. And a lot of it does have there are so many factors. There's so many factors and layers to that that we can Mm -hmm. like to unpack all of that right now. It'd be like another, you know, show. Right. But the gist of it being that how can I support a movement which at the seed of it, at the heart of it was about exterminating people that look like me and my offspring. Like I can't do that. Like that's just insane. Mm -hmm. Right. And then to start noticing that when you go, when you go into the cases of rape rape and incest, because that's the one thing that people say, well, the rape and incest, right? Well, I mean, it's such a minuscule part of Mm -hmm. abortions in general. Right that it doesn't count for the whole others that that are having these procedures done and they're not falling into that category. And if you want to say that contraception is failing, then why don't we have a class action lawsuit against these, you know, condom companies, these birth control p- companies, you know? So it just started to think, I started to start to think this just does not make sense. It doesn't. And so I err on the side of just saying I can't straddle the fence with this. It's yeah. either you're either one or the other. There's no way you can straddle the fence. And yeah. that's kind of where I stand with it, you know? Yeah, I just, I feel like it. we should say, even though it goes without saying, that if you're somebody who's watching right now and you've had an abortion, ah, uh, my beautiful sister, you know, there is forgiveness, there is mercy. You aren't the stupid things you've done. You aren't the sins you've committed. 
it's like we've been raised in this society that has lied to us ever since we were young. Mm. You know, me personally, since I was eight, I was lied to by pornography, right? That's when I first stumbled upon it. it. Here's what sex is. Here's what women are. Here's what women are for. Here's what marriage ought to be. And it's something similar where you've got all these movies and TV shows (coughs) and big tech lying to you about abortion. I mean, you were raised in this. And so in some ways, like... I know we have personal agency. I know we have to take responsibility for the bad things that we've done or have paid other people to do to us. But um, in in some ways, we are a victim in this. In this, right? Amen. Absolutely. I and mean, so, like, yeah. run to confession, you beautiful daughter. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, especially for today's culture, you know, any one of us who's born after the sexual revolution and stuff like that. Um, I mean, we were taught so many things like crazy. Like when I was coming up as a dancer in in the ballet world and stuff, um, and even in in the acting world in a way, but I really felt this pressure in the, in the dance world, our teachers as talented and amazing and legendary as many of them are Mm -hmm. and were, I mean, I remember there just kind of being this, this known, the silent thing, like, you don't settle down and have kids and get married if you think you're a serious artist. Like you, your whole life, your body, everything is like for the dance. It's for the yeah. art, you know? And I fell victim to that. Like really thinking that like I, and I did, I had to make a choice. It's like, if I'm going to be a serious artist mm-hmm. if I'm going to try to get into these companies, I'm going to try to do the things that I want to do. I'm going to have to forego that life for the art. Cause I want to be taken seriously. I was, we were all lied to in that way. You know, Mm -hmm. and I think that our culture in general, they do that with women in all aspects with you don't even have to be an artist. You know, it's like, oh, you get your education, go to school, go for your career. You can do all that stuff later. You know, nobody's telling you that, you know, them eggs, honey, Mm -hmm. time waits for no man or woman. You know what I mean? So I think that women get put in this position where it's like, okay, I have these dreams. I have these goals. I I don't have a way of necessarily supporting myself and a child, or this is bad timing. So the only thing to do that makes logical sense is to terminate the pregnancy because that's what society told me to do, Mm -hmm. like to put it off and wait. Because you're lied to on both accounts. You're told you won't be taken seriously unless you dedicate your entire life to this. Right. But then on the other hand, you're told, and it's essentially, you know, marriage is essentially a misogynistic institution and you'll end up being a kitchen slave if you went down this route and no one will respect you and who would want to be a stay-at-home mom anyway. Right. That's why I have such respect and admiration for women who are like, I'm a homemaker. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. It's wonderful. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and mm. and it's, it's it's interesting because when to I reclaim that, you know, yeah, yeah, that beauty of that. And I and I I meet women of all walks and stuff. And when I have women who talk about being, you know, oh, I'm a, you know, I'm just a stay at home mom. I'm like, no, you're not just you like you are mm. a homemaker. You that is amazing. Like, and you should be proud of that. It's I nothing think it was Chester. We've we've quoted him before, where he says some the quote. You know it. You look yeah, it up. I know it. Do it. Go. Uh, it's. Uh, Feminism is mixed up with the idea that a woman is free when she serves her employer, but a slave when she serves her husband. Yep. Boom. That's it. Amen. That's the one, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Amen. Okay, yeah. And then yeah. I know Anthony Eslin talks about, you know, scraping plaque off someone's teeth in a dentist office. Like somehow that's liberating. <laughs> yeah. But if you're at home uh, tending to your children. Never heard that one. <laughs> Anthony Eslin's the boss. Have you ever read him? No, I haven't. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. He's unreal. And okay. I don't think he can travel anymore, so I think we have to go to him. He's a Catholic intellectual. He wrote a book called Out of the Ashes, oh, which okay. I would recommend everyone read. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. know. That sounds familiar, but I have not read it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I was so. trying to find the quote, and the first thing that came up was that book. So, What? Out of the Ashes? Or? Yeah. 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 So re-educating ourselves. Man, it's hard when you're being lied to constantly. Well, yeah. Although I kind of feel like big tech and Disney and everybody else is overplaying their hand at this point. When I grew up, I was mm-hmm. in like the age of like Metallica and like rebelling <laughs> against the man. Like that was the thing. Like you would question authority. Mm-hmm. It feels like things have changed mm-hmm. a little bit for me in my world. It feels like it's like maybe the ancients, maybe tradition has something to teach us now since mm-hmm. we've all cut ourselves off from that. Yeah. To the point where I pointed out the other day that my son, who is not compliant by nature, like he's a firecracker. He's. Can confirm. He can confirm, right? <laughs> he said to me the other day, just randomly, he's like, yeah, I gave up watching Disney this year because of all the stuff they're pushing on us. So it's almost like the opposite. Like the, the woke left has become what Christians were said to be back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Mm-hmm. Boring, sensorial, preachy. I'm like, I don't, I don't, please stop preaching to me. Right. 
I think a lot of younger people are feeling that way about the sensorial left Hollywood big tech. It's like, just how about leave me alone? Like you said, let me just, I just want some dinner. Right. You know? yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there are interesting um, like reports and, and numbers coming out that, that are showing this trend. I think they say that like the younger generation now, the Z's, right? Mm-hmm. They're less. Is that you? That's me. All uh, right. Well, they're less sexually active than the mm-hmm. generations before them. And that's a big testament because they are, they, they're, oh my gosh. I think it's because they're awkward. Well, that too. <laughs> like all the, awkward, all the Gen honey. Z's are looking at porn in their mother's basement. I don't know they what's don't better. They to talk to each other. Well, I honestly don't know what's better. If y'all were fornicating or just like jerking off to porn. Yeah. Uh, I think part of it is <laughs> like, we're both looking at him. Give us the answer, yeah, Gen Z. Yeah, what's going on Do you there? want the, yeah, like, okay. Yeah, give me your unabashed, unvarnished answer. Okay, both cool, because I haven't don't thought about this at all. Yet, all right, well, But good. as you know, like 70% of the time when I haven't thought about something at all and then I go for it, I'm not super This will be off. edited out later. Go. Wait, <laughs> okay. give me mic, sorry. Um, I think, I don't think it's just uh, the advent of pornography. I think that's a large part of it. Um, I do think another part of it is that whether or not we want to admit it, the, um, sexual liberation ethic has failed to mm-hmm. some degree for my generation. Um, the, the myth that you can be totally promiscuous and have no negative effects down the road. I see. We don't I believe think, that anymore. I, I think that it peaked at the millennials but um it did enough damage to gen to families with gen x parents because of the divorce rate and the you know over half of the kids i went to high school with for example their parents were divorced it was just normal or and Mm -hmm. you know they had four parents because they had a a stepmom a stepdad a mom and a dad Mm -hmm. and so without ever saying it i think some people have started to realize that you need to be more careful when a lot of people in my generation have realized that they need to be more careful when picking a life partner i see because they don't want to end up to the point where they might freeze a little and right they freeze a little yeah. and they're scared because they don't want to end up that like makes their sense. parents did yeah. where yeah. They, they don't want their kids to grow up with four parents that you know each pair despises the other right because they you know that it was hard for them yeah yeah yeah, I was I was listening to something. Um, actually, I was listening. One of the things I was listening to earlier was New Polity, mm. which is the podcast yeah. that Thursday told me about. Like across the road. <laughs> yeah, 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 they're yeah. wonderful. Yeah. But um, there was something else that had followed that, and it it made me think about this very topic. Actually, this morning, I was like, it's interesting because the Generation Zs, like their parents, are like the X people like you know Mm -hmm. like mid to late X generation X somewhere in there right and the X's are the kids or the boomers or whatever Mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. so and the boomers were the ones that were really out there that that got into all the debauchery of like like all of the revolutions right it's like okay the 60s the 70s you know we're going to Woodstock half naked whatever they were doing right all the time right Studio 57 was really cool is this Studio 54 I don't know whatever thing was right everything's so cool back then right And they were the ones who were really coming about in this whole revolution and evolution of life and society, thinking that all of these things that they were instilling, all this free love and this and that, and like divorce rates went up and all these things, like these were things that would liberate our children and give them so much choice and so much like edification Mm -hmm. to do anything they want in their lives. And it's like, then you start seeing the millennials and the Z's being born and now the baby alphas, it's like, and you're realizing how this whole thing was a social experiment. And now we're just seeing the effects of this like 50, 60 late years later, like, whoa, hold up a second. Like this went awry somewhere, yeah. right? Um, and I think that's what that's what we're seeing. It's like the younger generation, it's, it's hard for you guys because the thing is, there's, everything is so hypersexual everything mm-hmm. like from the music to videos you know instagram instagram oh man right it's everything is in your face and anything goes right and these kids are experiencing things that even at our age like we'd never really experienced before it's just kind of like mind-blowing in some ways like i childhood for me was like go outside and play like mm-hmm. you're not watching television you're not playing video games that's for the weekends or whatever Go outside, mm. figure it out, imagine something, figure it out. 
read a book, do something. But the kids nowadays on the whole are not exposed to that. So they're constantly getting this messaging in. Oh, I remember what it was. So I was watching the news today and there's this thing called conscious parenting. It's been all over the news this morning. Okay. okay. Cause I always love to watch local news whenever I'm in a new area. Right. Yeah. So they're like, we're going to talk about conscious parenting, how great it is and how it exploded since the pandemic. All conscious parenting is, is literally parenting, parenting. your children. <laughs> okay? like, don't put them on social media. the opposite would be unconscious parenting. <laughs> I was like, what, is that? Like, what are you doing? I just looked up the definition. What is it? <laughs> child rearing philosophy that encourages parents to make mindful emotionally intelligent decisions in <sighs> raising their children what, go Funny. Figure. Go yeah. figure. what was the other option I don't know. <laughs> like, what is going on here right so it's no wonder you've got these kids pushing back because it's like they're seeing that this is insane you know but here's the thing it's i don't know what the numbers are because you have so many kids that are just indoctrinated with this from childhood mm -hmm. and they're going to the universities and they're coming out with all these crazy ideas. So you have some folks that are just like Thursday that are fantastically, you know, detaching themselves from this and so, like your son detaching themselves. But then you have a whole throngs of others that are just yeah. really all in it. So I don't know. Listen, folks, strap in. It's going to be some shenanigans. OK, <laughs> <Yeah>. so <laughs> well, I remember this coming home to me a couple of years ago when I was asked to give a talk at a big Franciscan University conference. I'm not sure if you're familiar with these youth conferences mm -hmm. happen around the country. They get like 40 to 60,000 teens. They're mm. amazing. All these kids on their knees before the Eucharist hearing great Amen. Orthodox Catholic teaching. But I was asked to give a talk on how to date as a teenager. And I was looking at the script. And I'm like, I don't, <laughs> don't. I don't think. Yes. I was like, I don't think you should date. It do, well, it depends what you mean by date, to be fair. It right. does depend on what you mean by date. But my point was, I think if you date, you'll just fornicate. So don't be an idiot. I said that because I just like needling the teens. I like being a little provocative. Mm -hmm. I said that to about 3,000, 3, maybe 5,000 teens. They all started clapping. And I actually thought they misunderstood me. So I reiterated mm -hmm. it. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, I don't understand these children at all. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. if I was 16, when I was 16, if someone said, you shouldn't be dating, I would have booed them. Or I would have went, like, that's over the top. But right. I've got all these teens in front of me cheering because they for some reason got it well, there's because, nothing there's nothing left to rebel into yeah <sighs> that's yeah, it's like into you gotta sanity. rebel into orthodoxy what you else is rebel there into sanity. yeah and sanity. i think also Amen. maybe it was yeah. a different culture right because i mean dating when you think about it was i mean even till like it really went off the rails let's say in like the 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 early to, to mid 2000s where dating just went this weird way but still up to that point people were still getting married and having children yeah. and settling down, like that was like the like, outcome. Even this is one of the most awful TV shows in all of history. Very funny, mm -hmm. but awful. Friends. Did oh, you yeah. watch Friends? I, you know, I never really got into it, but of course I know it. You if, know? They treated, if they treated fornication the way they treated cigarette smoking, namely <laughs> evil, it would have been a much healthier show. But like every yeah. episode is all about fornicating, fornicating, right. fornicating. And it was just... It's just a lie. It was well, just a yeah. lie. But even in that show, you they had to make them settle down. So even there, there was this belief that, well, eventually mm -hmm. you settle down. Whereas today, it's mm -hmm. like we've become perhaps so disillusioned because we're treating people like objects right, that right. we don't even see that as a option. Right, I don't right. Know. No, you're right. I mean, it, it makes me think of that show Sex in the City, which was really popular, right? I'm going to tell you a funny story real quick. Yeah. My <laughs> wife. Do you know the story? Yeah. Do you know? And you, because I know sometimes you've, you've watched this show. No, so I if haven't you heard know, this one. Go ahead. My wife <laughs> chewed out one of the actors in Sex in the City really? in a pub in a really? way that only Cameron Fred can. Oh, it's such wow. a great story. I don't, know who the, I don't know who the character was. It was the same fellow. Mr. Big? Who, oh, wow. He deserved it. Big Fat Greek Wedding. <laughs> He's the guy who played in Big Fat All Greek right, Wedding. I, well, I don't want to. I don't mean to. Well, so tell your story. So my wife, you and my wife, we get along really well <laughs> because she's just extroverted and powerful and beautiful. I just, mm -hmm. she's great. I love her. She's amazing. Yeah. She married up, but she's great. <laughs> um, and <laughs> we're at this pub in Houston and she sees this guy from Sex and the City and we're like, oh, gosh, like how sad. Like, what a crap show that is. Like, yeah, I, I'm going to tell him. And I thought she was joking and she wasn't joking. And so she went to talk to him and there was a like a little throng of women around him. And I'm like, OK, I guess this is happening. So I was just like sipping my beer, looking occasionally in her direction. And when I say chewed him out, I don't mean she was a jerk to yeah, him. No. But she just said, um, I really liked you in this movie, but I just think it's really sad, like mm -hmm. what you're doing right now. And I think you could probably doing a, be doing a lot better. Oh, yeah, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. That sounds Unintimidatable. Like, that my sounds wife. like Chris Noth, I think his name is. Did yeah. you look it up? 
Chris Noth is Mr. Big. Yeah. I'm trying to oh, figure sorry, out. I don't Big. think oh. he was in My Big Fat Greek Wedding. You know, you but just... maybe you thought the word big because his, name, his his character was Mr. Big on the show, okay. right? He was like a complete jerk, right? And of uh, course... It says that there was a guy named John Corbett in both. And if that's not correct, I don't know. it's fine. I don't anyway, it was some was. dude. Yeah, he's, he, he would definitely be the character that deserves the chew out, okay. right? So like... But you're watching these shows and like that's mm-hmm. what they're promoting. So was that know? a show you got into when you were younger I then, kind or? of watched. I mean, that was like more like in my... I don't remember when I was watching it. Like, I didn't watch it while it was like on on, but I started to catch reruns later on, right? Mm. And so you know, it's just kind of the you, not that you live the that life, but you kind of you live vicariously through the things that you see on television yep. and uh, in the movies. It's like oh, you know, it's like man, that Mister Big, he's so dreamy, he's such a jerk. I'm gonna look you know? him up. <laughs> it's like, but it's like oh, he's so cute. I so <laughs> want a guy to treat me like like I'm trash and then walk away from me. And this no, he's like they give you they feed you this weird Hollywood fantasy because like she was obsessed with this guy. And then, of course, the rest of the show is about promiscuity. So these are the things that like started to really change the culture in a major way, yeah. you know. Um, so I heard somebody say this recently because, you know, the dating world and I can see why kids nowadays would be averse to it because it's so messed up nowadays. It's because like someone had said this on one of those crazy podcasts. OK, there's a lot of crazy podcasts out there nowadays. OK, and one of the guys. To the corner. Yeah, well, th- this is no. good crazy. I'm okay. talking about like. Debauchery, like real <laughs> yeah. debauchery, crazy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the guys, and I was just like, whoa, when he said this, I was like, you must be insane. But I know now he said that dating today is for sex. It's not for relationships, it's for sex. Because what are people doing? Swipe, 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 swipe. Next thing you know, you're sleeping with somebody the first night, the first time you met them. You know, then they have the three date rules type of thing. It's like, it's not about forming relationship, mm-hmm. right? And then you've got like the dinner dates that that the the, the I'm, I'm not going to use the the word they use is it starts with a W, but the dinner girls who like dinners and hitting yep. dinner, right? Yep, yep. And then you have you know guy. It's just everybody. No one is thinking about oh, let me date to get to know you to have a relationship with you that we can possibly get married. Culture tells you don't get married, don't have kids. So what's everybody doing? So I the the generation Z today not wanting to do this, I I get it. Yeah. I get it. Because if this is what the outcome is and that everything that you're seeing that is sold to you as perfection is is rooted in, again, it's the vices. What does social media tell us that we want luxury? Mm-hmm. You you have to be wealthy. If you're not making like $100,000 a year as a man, you're worthless. If you're not, you know, telling guys, especially that like the, the thing that signifies your masculinity is how many women you've slept with, mm-hmm. right? All of these things and, and for women validate yourself by showing everything on online yep. or sleeping around like this is how you validate is less avarice. All of these things. This mm. is what make relationships. Why would you want to date? Why, yeah. would you, why wouldn't you want to just crawl in a hole, you know, grow a long beard for the guys, you know, ladies, just cover yourself up fully mm-hmm. head, you know, head to toe and just be a hermit. Yeah. Like it sounds like the best option. <laughs> you know of Escriva, Jose Maria Escriva? No. Oh, my gosh. You're going to love him. Here's <laughs> Saint Jose Maria Escriva. Listen to a couple of these quotes. Mm-hmm. Listen to this. Purity, they ask, and they smile. Mm-hmm. They are the ones who go on to marriage with worn out bodies and disillusioned souls. Ouch. Boom! <laughs> Another one. Ouch. There is a need for a crusade of manliness and purity to counteract and nullify the savage work of those who think man is a beast. Mm. And that crusade is your work. Amen. Okay, I Do have you to. you love Jose Maria Escrivain? So he's the founder of Opus Dei, if you've ever oh, heard of them. Oh, yes. Okay, and the he, name. Yes, okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. he writes in kind of spiritual maxim yeah. styles or aphorisms. Yeah. Um, he had this other line where he said, filthy talk makes us comfortable with filthy action, but the one who knows how to guard the something like that. But that was to Sorry. your point about sex in the city. It's mm-hmm. like filthy talk makes us comfortable with filthy action. So does exposing ourselves to like shows that glorify fornication. Amen. You might think you're separate from that somehow, but it's making you more comfortable with that lifestyle. Are you yeah. familiar with the, so you were just talking about this. There's a scientific study. I just pulled it up. Um, and they did a study recently and it showed that the more partners you have, it actually lowers the amount of neuro- the neurochemical production in mm-hmm. your brain that makes pair bonding for life easier. So like it is scientifically proven now that the more <laughs> casual or the more sexual partners you have, mm-hmm. it is going to be physically mm-hmm. more difficult for your brain to bond with your spouse. Yeah. Yeah, because when you think about the physiological uh, 
things that happen during sex. Like, and again, this is where my nerdiness about the body comes in and the whole theology of the body. This is why it all makes sense. I'm like, yes, I understand that. Because it's like, why is exercise, why do some people get really hooked on exercise and really love the lifestyle, right? It's because you get this euphoria, right? Yeah. You know, the runner's high. You get yeah. that, the the dopamine and the serotonin mm. and, the, and all of these endorphins start running through your body and you get hooked on that sensation and it makes you feel good. That's why exercise is great for those mm -hmm. who have depression, anxiety, because you have that suppressed hormone and now it's becoming okay. elevated, right? Okay. And if you're someone who is, <clears throat> your addiction to feeling good is through lust, is through sex, is through carnality, right? You're getting that hit. You're getting that hit. Then you're getting the oxytocin, right? Mm -hmm. So you're constantly getting that hit. Your receptors are constantly going off and getting this flood. And eventually, just like anything, your body gets used to a certain thing. Your tolerance for it gets higher and higher. So you need more of a hit, more yeah. of a hit in order to, to be able to, for it to work. Yes. And if you're not getting that hit from that one person where it's supposed to be coming from, that sexual bond is supposed to bring you together. So now you're getting it from this person, that person, you're getting heartbroken. I don't care what, I mean, you guys are men, so maybe you can talk differently. But for me, like a man who's highly promiscuous, it's like, they say that, oh, guys can just do whatever they want because they don't get emotionally attached. But it's like, that's just not even how your being is. So there has to be some level of something that gets taken from even you when you're having all of these sexual mm. experiences that are not connected to women. Let me answer. That as, you care about. Let, let me, me answer your as a, wife. As a Sorry. man. And then I want to give you a quote about women and have you respond as a okay, woman. Okay, please. Yes. So I think it's obviously true that the only thing that can conquer a desire is a stronger desire. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not shaming yourself. It's not guilting yourself. It's only something that's stronger. And you think, well, what could possibly be stronger than a man's desire to lust after a woman or to objectify a woman? And I think a lot of people will say, well, there really isn't. But it seems to me obviously true that there is. And if you watch some of the uh, movies that men really love, I don't mean like or find titillating or find funny. I mean, it resonates with them. I think what you often find is a main character who is a strong man who is willing to forego his life, you know, uh, for the love of a woman or for mm -hmm. a country or something larger than him. Amen. You know, and I think that it's like it's, Christopher West talks about in the theology of the body. It's like our heart is like a deep well. And mm -hmm. sure, on the top of that well, you might have a thick layer of sludge, but it doesn't end there. Just go deeper and deeper and you will tap into something life-giving and good and masculine. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And what's sad to me as a man is that the word masculinity has been tainted. It has, come, it has become, for many, synonymous with, um, what would you call it, Sh chauvinism mm -hmm. or, or Macho. petulancy Macho. or that. Yeah. 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 When it's like, no, the world is not suffering from toxic masculinity. The world is suffering from a toxic lack of it because the solution to men who will not stay by their women, who will not remain faithful, uh, who will not treat people with respect is precisely masculinity. That's what you need. You need manly strength for that. Mm -hmm. All right. Here's a quote for you from Edith Stein. Okay. She says, do not accept. Well, hang on. No, here it is. The world doesn't need what women have. It needs what women are. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I think that's true. And and, and, and it's funny because this is something that I, this is one thing that sent me on an even deeper level of spirituality, faith, you know, adult faith, faith formation. What does it mean to be a woman? Yeah. You know, outside of the fact that, of course, part of that is our physiology, our physical bodies, mm -hmm. you know, that differentiate us from men, but what's deeper than that, right? What does it mean to be a woman in the eyes of Christ? You know, and so it gets to the essence of just who we are, nurturing creatures, carrying creatures. That's my stomach. I hope you guys didn't hear that. <laughs> it's like it's been growling as I say that, right? Um, <laughs> nurturing creatures, carrying creatures. We are life bearers on this planet. Like there's so many, we're creative. We are so many things that we can add to just the world and our mm. families and this, our husbands and our children and everything that I think that that gets lost in today's culture. So I can, I can understand that because it's about the deeper thing. The intrinsic yeah. thing, yeah. the intrinsic value. It's, it seems to me, and feel free to push back if you disagree, that that feminism or much of feminism is saying we need what women have. You know, be mm -hmm. be like men, as opposed to recognize women for what they are. Mm -hmm. And it seems like transgenderism is, in some ways, at least in part, an attack on women. Where it's not like, well, you can be like men. It's saying, well, you can be a man. Actually, exactly that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Which I think is perhaps why we're seeing this return to tradition and this return to authentic. We're trying to grope for it, right? Mm-hmm. And sometimes it looks weird and awkward. Mm-hmm. And you, you see this in men, right, where it's like we're grasping for the accidents of masculinity mm-hmm. because we're trying to figure out what the substance is. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot about beards and... Uh, I'm someone who owns a cigar lounge, but cigars <laughs> and, and things like this, right? Where it's like we, we just want what our grandfathers seem to have. But, of course, the accidents of masculinity without the substance is just a show. It's yeah. just a LARP. And I'm sure the same is true for women. You look passionate about this point. Feel free to interject if you no, want. No, I'm just very happy that's what you're saying because I think that is um, – and I think so without the actual substance, the accidents can seem um, – contradictory Mm -hmm. and that's why we have um masculinity uh gurus like jocko who are like the opposite of guys like um what's the the bloke from romania who just got arrested andrew tate Tate. yeah andrew tate Uh, right like they seem like they're contrary to each other right Mm -hmm. but they're both actually and they're both missing it. Very, they're both missing the mark. I don't know much about Jocko, so I couldn't speak to it. But Jocko Willink. Yeah, I know who. I know. I know okay. some they're both about him, missing but. the mark, right? But they're mm-hmm. both grasping at an accident of masculinity, right? You're not um, putting them in the same camp, are you? I mean, I, from what I understand, no, Andrew I'm, Tate is a is a spinster. I, for, that's yeah. No, he's a bad. I think, right. but I think Jocko also misses it. Is How what so? I'm saying that he he's like it's all about like his his entire form of masculinity is like. Is the I think it's almost like the toxic fitness. You, you might be able to speak to this better, mm-hmm. but it's like, like every morning, like if you go to his Instagram page, every morning he posts like a picture of his watch. Like I woke up at four a.m. and then it's like <laughs> his sweat, and then the next post is his sweat on the ground uh-huh. after his morning workout, and it's like I don't know why, but I need to look that up. <laughs> that's like not. It's the affectation of it. It's yeah. it's not like. But like, it's not to say that that's incongruent with masculinity. Yeah, but his like the other thing he does is he like hosts a podcast where they all they talk about is war stories. That's kind of so cool, though, isn't it? I mean, it is, but like that's not that's not the substance of masculinity. The substance of masculinity is not like, yeah, and then I killed this guy, and then I killed this guy, <laughs> oh, and I then I, I okay. killed this guy, and then like my buddy died, and it's like, it takes masculinity to do those things, but that isn't masculinity. Mm-hmm. But see, you know? he'd agree with that. I'm going to defend Jocko, who I don't know. He would agree with everything you just said. I See, but he's like, if you get on and you're like, I don't think... To me, a clear sign that someone is lacking the the substance of masculinity is... Well, let me put it this way, right? So in the Summa Theologiae, Aquinas, it's a translation of the Latin, of course, but he uses the word effeminate. Mm-hmm. And he says that men, so I might, might be kicking a hornet's nest here, but he says that men who are effeminate are men... And, and that's different to feminine. It's, it's not like it's not an attack on women, but he's saying that, that men who are effeminate are men who cannot do their duty and take the path that's that's easier over their over their duty. And I think that that would be a big part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, I had a I thought. Know. I think like, it bugs me just because he's lacking religion. Like yeah. he well, wants, the, okay, he wants to fight. This is what I was about to hit on. Yeah, the problem that I see with and, and there's there's the men's um, uh, version of masculinity, and then there's there's also the female end that's very popular okay. nowadays, talking about how to be more feminine, how to be okay. you know. But the way that 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 these talking points are coming from are from the dating perspective. So it's a lot of what I call dark femininity. Mm. How to get a be more alluring? How to get men attracted to you? How to get a man to do this? How to get a high value man and all that stuff, right? So you're seeing these talking points on both the men's and women's side, and they're all hearkening back to this this time before any of us were alive, right? Like, oh, our grandparents did that. Your grandparents also went to church every Sunday. Your grandparents also prayed and read the Bible. Your grandparents, all they, they were not perfect. You know, and there's a lot of things that went along in society at that time, but your your grandparents' culture, that's what was the norm. Your grandparents' culture uphold, upheld religion and spirituality and believed in God, and we don't have that. So once you stripped all of that away, now you're trying to fit a, a, a circle into a square peg. It's not working, and that's why it's not working. Like a lot of these guys mm. are out there talking about Women need to be submissive. You need to submit to a man. No, sweetheart. You know, the Bible says that I should be submitting to my husband, not Mm. some random boyfriend, not some random man on the street just because you have testosterone, right? No, Mm -hmm. that's not how it works, right? 
So it, there's a lot of missing things. And this is kind of what I meant when I said we're kind of groping for the essence yeah. of masculinity and femininity masculinity here. Masculinity without religion becomes, it's this, somebody in the comments just said that it's without its true end. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I, right. I, but I'm sure like you perhaps see that, uh, and you can talk to this on the side of women as well, where mm -hmm. it's like, we gotta go back, we gotta go back. Um, but then it, it then it it does the same. It has the same problem that the left has in that it two dimensionalizes you and says, well, as a woman, that means you must be like this and like mm -hmm. this. And I think part of the reason people like my my wife's podcast, for example, is that she doesn't fit that stereotype woman, but she's ex beautifully feminine, right? You know, and, right, right, and and would say that she's submissive and 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 in in the most beautiful, powerful way, you know, um, right, right, competent. She's competent. Amen. Um, people hear powerful and they think um, dominating, but competency is, I think, what we're after. But right, well, yeah. and that's why. I so, had how, to... how do you see that happening? Like, do you see women on channels kind of telling you to be a certain way? Like, I think you're missing the point. I see that you're groping for something good, but you're still off base here. Amen. Absolutely. Because I, okay, so there's an interesting connection with this for me because like, um, after I had finished, you know, I knew that I wasn't going to be bodybuilding anymore professionally. Like I took a step back because I reached my ceiling as far as how far I could push without steroids. Right. And I was just looking at my divisions like, whoa, these ladies are going too far. Like my family is already freaking out about me. Like being too lean is like, girl, <laughs> like, no. So I was like, yeah, I don't want to lose that that essence of what out, at least outward femininity is, right? So I started to get into these channels that talked about like femininity and womanhood and stuff. And I love vintage, like I've always loved the 1950s, like mm. the just the look and all that. Mm -hmm. So when I was like revamping, like just my style, I went very 1950s. If you go back nice. and look at some of my stuff, it's like very like, they called me Melanin Monroe here, okay? Ah. Cause I had the whole thing going, yeah. all right? And so, it, I started to follow a lot of people who were kind of in that genre, that feminine, like, and it was always the same thing. It's like, well, if you're feminine, you have to talk really soft like this because feminine women don't raise their voice and make this box of what womanhood yes. meant. And I'm just like, that's what I'm this talking is about. not it. Right? Yeah. So I started to step away. Like, you know where I'm going to go for my source. Let me go to the Bible. See, mm. And I was like, Oh, yes, look at Ruth, idea. look at <laughs> yes. Esther, look at Judith, look yes. at these women who were powerful women. Yes. One of my favorite analogies that I love to link up is about Ruth specifically, right? Because you have a lot of different talking points. Number one, the talking point that like older women are like useless. If you're over the age of like 25, 18, whatever they say in, in the manosphere these days, that you're useless as a woman. The whole- Don Lemon. <laughs> did you hear what happened with him recently? Oh, Don no, Lemon? He yeah. Oh, he got fired, didn't he? Did he? I think, sorry, well, we maybe, shouldn't, we shouldn't sorry, say it with okay, as sorry, much glee okay. as we're saying it, but... <laughs> I thought he got fired months ago, and then I found out he didn't. Well, I no, he was sure on a morning show, but he spoke get... out against... Uh, who's that Sheila who just uh, said she wants to run for president? Oh, Nikki Haley? Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, then well, he said something like, well, you're not in your prime either. And then his two <gasps> women co-hosts were like, what do you mean by that exactly? <laughs> Sorry. See, I, I got to start watching more TV again. So <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't I heard do it. something do it. about whatever, but yeah. yeah. So, like, one of the things that I that I always kind of point out is that, well, in the story we have of Ruth, right? And and why I love Ruth is because for everyone that wants to say that women had no place in the Bible, you're so like oppressed and all these things. I mean, of course certain things you can probably twist it like that, but women were powerful in the Bible, but she, it, it was through her, her womb and her lineage that Christ, his, that's where his ancestry came, right? Because Ruth married Boaz. Boaz was the father of Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. And where did Jesus come from? The house of mm -hmm. David, right? So from that, from that lineage flew, was that connection directly to Christ. But at the same time, who was the woman who ushered all of that through? It was Naomi that was like, hey, girl, you know, go on to Boaz. Let me tell you what to do. Mm. Go on, put on your best clothes, put on a little perfume, go sit on his threshing floor. I mean, an older woman who set the, who, who mentored this younger, you know, I mean, Ruth wasn't that young, but like still she was young enough to have a child and, and a lineage to go ahead and set this amazing thing that would bring us to Christ. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I looked and like, well, these are real women. These are the feminine. This is femininity in action. This is strength. This is beauty. This is grace. This is humility. The Blessed Virgin Mary. Come on. Like, imagine being a teenager and mm. you're just chilling out, mind your own business one day, and this angel comes up, like, hey, guess what? I mean, it wasn't, this is my version, guys. Okay. He's like, hey, guess what? You know, Hail Mary, guess what? You're going to have the son of a oh God. You're going to have the, she's like, what? What? You know? <laughs> 
fine. It's cool. Do what you need. We need a, need a, we need a Roxy <laughs> cartoon, translation. Right? This is my yeah. my version of the Bible. Great guys. But it's like, could you imagine she was scared? You see this angel, right? And he's going to tell you like, hey, you're going to have a kid. And this kid is like going to be the man mm. that changes the world. And you say, you don't say, oh, no, this is too much for me. You say, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to his will. Like that was your answer. Like, yes, mm. submission. That like receptivity trusting. is your strength. Right. Yeah. Mm. So it's like, wow. And it's active. It's that, not passive. That's right. the thing. Like receptivity. Like you think of the sexual act, the receptivity of the woman is an active receptivity. It's not a passivity. Amen. It's in her active receptivity that she gives her gift of femininity and allows you in. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like every example I needed of femininity was right there. And that's when I saw, wow, all of this other stuff, this is so dark, mm. you know, because you're now you're just equating femininity to serving to the accidents of it again I right exactly something to that right right mm. and nobody wants to talk about this because the moment you start bringing religion into it, it's like oh you know uh, mm -hmm. but you cannot demand the things that are that are of god and you cannot demand that and put it in the hands of man and think he's going to be able to do and when i say man i mean human humanity mm -hmm. there that we're going to be able to do the right thing like we need the guardrails we need the 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 way the truth and the light you know so mm. How many times do you post on your YouTube channel? Is it like, are you trying to get out a certain amount of videos every week or? I would love to, I, you know, it's it's pandemonium trying to run two channels and a business at yeah. the same time. So like right I, now it's just like me doing everything. So I, yeah. but I, I, I stay consistent about like once a week, once or twice a week, but I also got hip to doing shorts. So that kind of okay. like feeds them off to like, okay mm -hmm. guys, here's a little something. something yeah. to like <laughs> How did you get so good at editing and thumbnails? Cause they're excellent. Thank you. Well. When I was back in college, I used to work in the computer lab, right? Uh -huh. And all I used to do was sit there and they had Photoshop and mm -hmm. like Adobe Premiere. Well, no, Premiere wasn't out by that point, but like they had Photoshop and stuff. So I just learned how to do that, learned how to create websites and all that stuff just in my free time. So I just, it was just had been something that I just been practicing and practicing. And I have a very artistic eye. Like I, I used to draw and paint when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So I think that just like translates to me with the thumbnails, like, Speaking of YouTube, I watch like folks who talk about YouTube channels and how to make them better. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of really great channels out there that really talk about, okay, this is how you need to do your thumbnails. This is how you should edit. This is how you do. So I just started to put things in action and um, here we are. Can we try to give some advice to people who might be running a YouTube channel yeah. or who might want to? Absolutely. Because there are certain things that I keep seeing and I'm like, oh, please don't do that. That's not going to work. <laughs> So let me throw, throw out a few things that I think I've learned. And you tell me if it resonates with you yeah. or if you disagree. I like the idea that the thumbnail stops the scroll mm -hmm. and the title gets you to click. Mm -hmm. So I used to make the mistake of putting the same text on my thumbnail mm -hmm. that I did in my title. Right. And once I realized, no, it's the thumbnail that gets you to stop, then I, I realized, well, that's not a good idea. Um, also, big, big images like 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 you do, like big eye-catching images not mm -hmm. and and to, and to try to when you're coming up with a thumbnail to realize that a lot of people are watching these on their phone mm -hmm. so what is this going to look like when it's this big mm -hmm. and the text you're putting on the thumbnail isn't even able to be read and then sometimes you put the text in but the time stamp or the the time mm -hmm. overlaps with the thing you're trying to convey so that's not a good idea um what else yeah i think those are great those are wonderful um <laughs> I got a really interesting piece of advice that a lot of like top level, like content, uh, people who take who, notes Thursday. Yeah. These are people <laughs> who have channels that are specifically about how to do YouTube better. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to name drop cause I don't know if I can name drop like on here or not, but like, I don't know. mind. Oh, okay. If... Like one of them is channel makers. Okay. He's really good. And then there's VidIQ. Um, they're excellent. Uh, Nick Nimmin. Uh, Robert, Robert, Roberto Blake. These are the guys I like watch constantly, right? And they always talk about, okay, so when you create your, before you even do your video, like create your thumbnail first mm. and then do your title or at least have them at the same time, but the thumbnail should be first. So that way, whatever it is that you, once you do your script and you sit down and you're talking about it, it all just relates. So that way, when they get, when you get the click, you've got to be able to keep them there, right? Mm -hmm. So if you create that stuff first, know the title and the thumbnail first, then sit down to record, it kind of all flows together. So mm -hmm. I thought that was really helpful. That's excellent. Yeah. It kind of guides your artistic approach as you're 
creating the content. Yes. It all goes back to the thumbnail. I like that. Yeah. And then when you're talking about titles, don't always think about like, oh, how to pray the rosary. Like you yeah. want to think about something that's going to, first of all, create interest. Like, for instance, the I forgot what I titled the, my my scriptural rosary. I didn't call it like scriptural rosary. It's like something like how to increase increase Christ in you in your life with this rosary. Like mm -hmm. things that like excite that will cause uh, you know um, someone to click and want to actually see it because that's what the algorithm plays on. Yeah, it's it's better to get uh, your traffic from browse and and suggest it than just search because search is is only finite with the audience. Mm -hmm. But browse and suggest it will be people actually will come back time after time to see your videos. I thought that was really helpful. And then with the actual videos themselves in editing style um, is to keep keep the pace moving like every three to four seconds you should be changing your frame whether it's zooming in or mm. zooming out using b-roll the kind of music that you use and, and paying attention to that that can all drive a, a video forward so those are all the things that i try to pay attention to in addition to the ones that yeah. you just mentioned i also like the idea i think it's been helpful for me to realize not to bury the uh the word that you're trying to don't bury it at the end of the sentence of your of your uh, title Mm -hmm. because it gets cut off sometimes. Right. And so you're trying to say something and the very thing that you're trying to get people interested in is buried there. Right, right. The keyword. Yeah, the yeah. keywords. Yeah. And the, the other thing about the title is to keep it 60 characters or less because that'll mm. stop it from getting cut off. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, you want to really just make sure that whatever you have to say, that you get it in the 60 characters and that it's just something that'll make people say, huh, and then boom. The other thing I found is... And it seems so obvious, but the things I'm excited about, other people tend to be excited about mm -hmm. as opposed to, well, let me, how can I make people think this is exciting? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, just if you made it exciting, if you like, not just exciting, but just interesting and worth listening to doing those things is what's going to get yeah. people to click. But yeah. I, I, I have to say though, I've been interested. There's been more, I've been coming across more videos lately of people who seem to be going against all of this advice. <laughs> Um, and are doing fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, I, I, I like these videos of these fellas who are just like sitting out in a field, just like sharing their thoughts. Right. And there's no oh, intro yeah. and there's no music and there's no quick, 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 quick. It's One just of my like, favorite guys right now is Wrangle Star. He does that. I want him on my show. Let's Wrangle get him. Star is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Wrangler School. That guy? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm Wrangles, thinking of yeah, I know Dwayne, you're talking. Here. Dwayne here. John Quick Wrangler School. Nah, Wrangle right. Star is a guy on. who used to be a... Uh, he used to be a wildland forest firefighter. Okay. Oh wow! And he he now just kind of runs his homestead uh -huh. and has his manservant Jedediah and lives with his <laughs> wife. And See? he just makes videos on like how to do cool man stuff, like yeah. put a new head on an. It's ass. relatable. That's what it is, you know. And and like when you get to the point, like you don't need introductions. You don't need you don't need anything fancy. If even if you sat down in front of, of a camera. You don't even need all yeah. the things, all the bells and the whistles. If you yep. have something that people can connect to, that's the most yes. important thing because yes, this yes, is what yes. this is all about. Yeah, you can't right? compensate for that. Right. I'll tell you, one of my favorite channels, and this is insane, but it's this guy. His name is Nate the Hoof Guy. Okay. And he goes into like different farms and he like scrapes the hoof of of cows. Okay. And they'll be like pus filled and all this other, but he's trying to fit, find like where the injury is on the cow and How like to amazing. relieve it and like scrape it. I love it. It's like, like imagine pitching that to a TV network <laughs> like, 30, 50 oh, years ago. We're just going to scrape some <laughs> cow hooves. That's what we're going to do for like six to 12 minutes. And yet minutes. I'm sure he's very successful. Oh man. He's got like millions of views, like hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. And like, and we all love it. It's just, you're fixated on this cow scraping thing. And, this hoof. Yep, yep. and it's just, it's the relatability. Like yeah. you don't need all of that. I, I have some videos where I'm just sitting down talking to the camera relating mm -hmm. to my audience. Audience and they do just as well because you're talking about something that people are interested in and you're being authentic at the end of the yeah. day. And that's what's really important. Yes. I th I've been told this. I haven't verified it, that it used to be the case that YouTube would, uh, you know, it, it would make your video pop up more if it was clicked on. You know, and that was mm -hmm. the, that was the primary indicator of as to whether or not this was a successful video. But of course, you could just, that that just lends itself to clickbait. You can come up right. with something, everyone clicks on it. So then they added interaction with mm -hmm. the video and then how long people are watching the mm -hmm. video for. So to your point that you don't have to have these quick camera changes and this really fancy music and this really great setup. If what you're saying is interesting and people are sticking around, that thing's going to, yeah. 
Yeah, well, the, yeah. YouTube has become so intuitive now, and I have to really credit them for this because if you look at the back end for oh. the creators, the creator studio, like it's fascinating, it's isn't fantastic it? because you can see so much data. And if you know what to look for, you know how to make things better. Like yeah. one of my favorite markers for a success of a video, and this is something that they push out themselves and say that you should pay attention to, is the first 30 seconds. Like you want 70% of your viewers still on the video at 30 seconds. Okay. And then to go forward, you want to have as close to 50% of the viewers for the entire video as much as possible. Now, if you go down to like 40s or something, that's great. But if you can maintain like half, the, half your audience throughout, depending on the length, you know, once you start getting longer videos, of course, that number is going to go a little bit lower. But if you can at least get the first 30 seconds to get them hooked and then a steady line, mm. then, you know, you got a great video and you just need to keep replicating whatever it is that you did to make that kind of success. Here's, the, here's the pitfall of that, though. Um, the, the, the pitfall is you can imagine somebody, let's say, like a Catholic personality who like starts doing these videos and he's talking about what he believes in and what's interesting and they're not doing that well. Mm -hmm. And then one day he does a video where he just talks about how awful these bishops and oh, Pope yeah, Francis are. It's like, oh, that did well. <laughs> yeah. And then all of a sudden it's mm -hmm. like the temptation for all of us. I'm not mm -hmm. putting out anyone in particular. This is, this is, this is true for all of us, whether it be in the Catholic <laughs> space or I'm sure exercise space or whatever is you just end up becoming the puppet through which the people talk through and mm -hmm. you just keep cha that one thing did well so i keep replicating that right. and i think that's something we all have to be on guard against it's like is it about clicks and views well yes i like right. that it feels good more income comes in through youtube or is it about how do i communicate what i think i'm being called to communicate how right. have you right. wrestled with that or of course absolutely because like um that happened on my other channel actually and i and it happened again i have to watch out for it um, whereas I, there were certain t topics that I s had spoken about that had caught, especially when I started talking about obesity and I was talking about it in the black community, particularly talking to black women, because we have a high level of obesity in our community. So that's a huge talking point again, in the manosphere section of YouTube, right? The what? Man the manosphere. Okay. That's like the men's masculinity, <laughs> you know, see. all that other stuff. Ah. Yeah. That's what that's called. And in, 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 in the black manosphere in specific, that's a huge talking point. And you have men and women talking about this. So if I put out a video that talks about obesity and black women and how do they make that better, I get all of those folks over here and they're all watching stuff that has nothing to do with my channel. Right. So then they'll watch a video or two and you'll get all these subscribers and all this other stuff. And then boom, it takes your channel because when you start releasing videos that are actually on mm. par with what you do and not just a one hit thing that just hits the algorithm, they're not there for that. So they start falling by the wayside. So right? then the temptation is, well, maybe I'll rebrand my channel and right, make it and all about, about black right, obesity and right, women. Yeah. Well, the same thing started to happen when I started. Uh, obesity is something that I is, is a hill that I will die on because like to me, I have had people in my family, of course, who are who deal with this and like, you know, my, my wanting to help them or just women in general, like mm -hmm. regardless of their, their race or ethnicity, but the whole body positivity, fat acceptance movement. I mean, there've been women that were influencers in this space who recently have died. Like it's been crazy. So I will do a video and I'm super compassionate about my message, but then you get the folks that, that are really like crazy about this and these channels that, that, that are really hard on this topic and as they do it for more sensationalism, right? So I put out a video or two about this and then of course you get that mm -hmm. that whole sector of folks coming over. So it's like, oh great. So if I talk about eating healthy and protein shakes, oh, you guys don't wanna watch that. But the moment I talk about obesity, mm -hmm. it's like, here you come out the woodwork. So you have to keep a pulse on that, right? The virility, virility is good. Is that a real word? I don't know. I don't know, it is now. Virality. <laughs> virality. But that's virality. not the same. Vi virality. Yeah, virality. Okay. Vi virality. That's a, it's a good thing on one hand, but it's a double-edged sword because it's like, you're going to have to keep feeding the monster and the monster is the algorithm. Mm -hmm. And the thing that drives the algorithm is always going to be controversy. It's always going to be things that are sensationalist, yeah. right? So you have to walk that fine line in knowing if you decide to cover those kinds of topics, how do you do it in a way that's going to still get your message across and still like when you do release other stuff, it still keeps with the audience. So you can't just give into it. You have to just yeah. kind of like skirt the line all the time. I want to press into that as a, as a personal fitness trainer. How do you navigate that? Because you do have this body positivity movement that's mm -hmm. just like, I don't know, fatisbeautiful.com is probably a website. And it's something <laughs> that people might say. Uh, 
how, how do you yeah how do you navigate that because you want to be sort of sensitive to people's struggles to lose weight mm-hmm. uh, and even maybe their inability at some level to lose weight because they have a life and they have kids and not everybody can spend three hours in the mm-hmm. gym every day and not everybody has the money to eat as well as they they could right right um so how do how do you um kind of I don't mean condemn obese people. I mean, how do you condemn obesity as a thing? Mm -hmm. In other words, this is not healthy, this is not good. And at the same time, be loving. And how have you found that? Well, interestingly enough, I've been kind of against the grain when it comes to fitness for a very long time. I've been fitness for years, okay? And so my platform in general has always been kind of about like combating the the lies and the myths that we see in the industry when it comes to diet and training anyway, specifically mm-hmm. when it came to like women. So I think that me having that reputation, like it's like, oh, she's no nonsense and she's going to tell you like it is, but she's always going to do it with compassion. That's kind of always been my thing. Okay. So when I decided to look at this issue, seeing how far it's growing with the push on social media and realizing like, hey guys, like let's wake up here. All of you that are saying that you're healthy and obese, like there have been literal studies and here they are, let me lay them out for you where, yeah, you can be young and you can be healthy and obese at the same time, but it always catches up to you. It always does study after study shows this. And it's like, we have such an urgency now that like, I don't have time to be stopped. Like, listen, these young 20 something year old, 30 something year old women in about 20 years from now, you, if you don't die, then you're going to be regretting trying to now get yourself healthy after years of like doing all this stuff. So I don't care. It's like, I have something to say, but I'm going to say it with as much compassion as I can. I'm going to go ahead and rip the bandaid off and say, Hey, look, don't get mad at me. Here's what the studies say. Here's what the reality is. Now let's go ahead. Not just like end the video there. Let's give you solutions. Mm. This is how you fix it. Let's acknowledge that a lot of you are dealing with trauma. You need therapy. You need a dietitian. You need a, a trainer. And if you can't do that, this is some other avenues to get that done. And I think that's the approach that I have that allows me to stay grounded in this and mm. not go on a lambasting tour of like, like you know, disparaging people just because they're overweight. You know, mm-hmm. that doesn't that doesn't help anyone. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. I I don't know. Growing up, when I heard the word obese, I had an image in my mind of what that looked like, namely like really fat. But it seems like today has the definition changed because I meet some people and they say they're technically obese. I'm like, you don't look it. Mm. You just look kind of fat or pudgy, but you don't look. No, I I think it's the definition hasn't changed. And you might know better than me that it's it's 30 plus BMI. Right. It has to do with the BMI. But I think more people we see are more overweight. And so obese looks less fat than it really is because we see less normal, healthy weight people. Well, and and that's the thing, too, because we have a huge obesity crisis, not only in the United States, but across the world, right? So now our eyes are getting affixed to seeing people that we would consider normal are actually overweight. Because if you looked like years in years past, again, nostalgia of yesteryear, obesity wasn't necessarily a thing because people were more active. People ate healthier. People didn't eat out all the time. They weren't eating, you know, preserved foods and all this stuff. So body mass indexes were a lot more normal than they are today. You know, when you get used to how our society has changed, body sizes change. And then what we see as acceptable in the society in general changes. So it's like, it skews your, per, your perception, right? Yeah. So I, I think that's what, what, what's really being at play here. Awesome. Hey, let's take a break. And then when we get back, I want to, I want to actually talk more about that, about how, how you might counsel somebody who's obese, how, Mm -hmm. how we could begin to lose weight and get healthier. And I also want to talk about bodybuilding and then we're going to take questions from our local supporters. So there is a link in the description below. Click that. We, we uh, always prioritize our local supporters, but if you've got an interesting enough question, put it in the live chat. And if it's sufficiently interesting Thursday, we'll save it and we'll ask that as well. Try locals, uh, all caps for a free month. Yes. If you want to support us, go to mattfrad.com slash locals, click the link in the description below. And if you type in try locals, I know you just said this, but (laughs) <laughs> in capital letters, no space. You get a month free and you can try it out. If you don't like it, you can quit. Sweet. Any sinner is capable of being a great saint. And any saint is also capable of being a great sinner, a great sinner, a great sinner. of 
character development is the realization of this power that there is in each and every one of us. For good and for evil, good and for evil, good and for evil, good and for evil. And the good Lord would have us lay hold of what is worst in ourselves. Do not think that people who have virtue and kindness and other great talents just came by these things naturally. They had to work at them very hard, got them very hard, got them very hard. We're live We are live. And this is the one minute where I need to talk about Hello because they pay me to do it. Why do you like Hello? That way I don't have to do much ad. Well, Hello is a wonderful app for those of you. (laughs) (laughs) It's a great ad voice. (laughs) Who are, yeah, it's it's good to me. Um, Hello is a wonderful app for those of you who are yearning for the desire to go to grow closer to god i really need to start paying my <laughs> guests to do the ad reads it is really cool though isn't it <laughs> i like it because it makes prayer and maybe this is the wrong thing to say but it does it makes prayer easy because it's very it's very easy to make the excuse not to show up right mm-hmm. or not to have the time oh i don't have time to do the rosary guess what if you got 10 15 20 25 minutes honey you just set it right there my favorite one i think her name is anna or something i'll let anna do the rosary with me <laughs> okay we do the rosary together okay <laughs> she's great <laughs> and she's great hello.com slash mafrad <laughs> click the link when you sign up on that page you'll actually get three months for free if you sign up on apple the bad thing about that is Hello doesn't get as much money, which means Apple gets more money. Mm. And if you sign up on Hello, you can cancel after three months if you want and not get charged. 
my wife has it. I have it. We find it really cool. And also, I love, I, I can't, I know it's, I don't know what you think about sleep stories, but oh, yes. I'm a fan. Yeah. Mark Hart. And welcome to tonight's Bible story. Amazing. My name is Mark Hart. Come on, what a voice. I'll be reading a collection of readings. What a guy. I mean, so check him out. Hello.com <laughs> slash my friend. <laughs> Sweet. All right. Obesity. Yes. Losing weight. Mm -hmm. How do you lose weight? I think I know. Yeah, well, I mean, the... the, the but how do you... <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Because, you know, sometimes like people come to you and they ask you a question mm -hmm. and it's like they don't mean it. It's like when people say to me, like, how do I, how do I quit porn? And mm -hmm. I give them some advice and they don't want that advice. We want something else that's mm -hmm. just, is there a pill I can take? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Do you find that too, that it's like... Yeah, <laughs> all the time. Yeah. I mean, it could be because it's hard at the end of the day because, all right, the, the easiest answer is stop eating yeah eat less move more right yep. but what does that mean how do you do it right oh you mean you have to have discipline oh you mean you have to have like consistency effort it means you have to sacrifice and forego certain things mm -hmm. it means you have to change your habits your mindset it means you got to like for some of you going for the trauma and healing that and getting to the root as to why you turn to excessive eating for some people. When we're talking about obesity in particular, a lot of times you have people who are dealing with not only a host of hormonal issues, because that is a real thing for some people, but also overeating and eating disordered and, and disordered eating and stuff like that. So you have to get to the root of that and uncover all that. And that's the hard stuff that people just like, mm. okay, just give me a pill. You know, If the pills worked, if the quick fixes worked, then we wouldn't have a fitness industry or a diet industry. That's a multi-billion dollar industry that mm. gets rich off of your naivete. It gets rich off of you staying stuck. It doesn't want you to have the answers, right? So once you start to discover the answers for yourself and you learn how to do things for yourself, that's when you become free. I and mean, when I say free, you start to not only lose the weight, but you keep it off. So it's a, it's a long story, but it's mm. the thing is, it's a hopeful story. I have a client right now. Um, I, I'm actually working with two clients who uh, what one of them started off as being very obese in, in, in the case of what science and doctors would say BMI. She just lost 100 pounds or over 100 pounds. Mind you, this is an online client that I have never personally met face to face. You know, of course, we've zoomed and talked and stuff. And I give her a workout. She goes to the gym. She trains. She follows her diet. She checks in with me every single week. She stays steadfast to what it is that she wants to do and puts her goals. We really sit down and focus on what do you want and why is it important to you? Mm. What's the why behind the reason? And so she's been able to do that. And that's, you know, that's a wonderful gift of life that I can give to her. You know, um, another client of mine right now, he's down about 30 pounds and he is a very heavy guy. He's very tall. Mm. But he weighs a lot. I'm not going to say how much he weighs, but he, we, we could have at least a good two to 300 pounds to lose, you know, on, on his frame alone. Mm -hmm. And so, again, it's just like retraining him how to approach food. He lives in the South, all this good Southern food. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, honey, listen, we got to get that together. We got to get you. You may not be able to work out, but can you can you walk a thousand steps a day. Mm -hmm. You know, now you're doing 3000 steps. Can you, fantastic. How can we add little things to change your life? Not just here's a diet and starve yourself. That's easy. How do we change your life and give you the tools to be able to keep it off forever? And that's kind of my, my approach to this whole fitness thing. Just being in Guatemala, we spent a few weeks in Antigua and we realized that we were probably walking about two hours a day. Mm -hmm. uh, even my wife with all of her health issues, she was doing much better there. Because it's a very walk friendly town and we would just walk everywhere. We didn't have a car. Mm -hmm. And it made me think of how little I often walk here. I walk to my car, I drive to work, I walk up the road to get a coffee, I walk back to my car, I drive home and Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's the little things like that as a New Yorker mm. or as as it almost as a New Yorker. Okay, as a mm. New Yorker. We walk everywhere. Like I didn't even get a license until I was moving to LA. I got it like the month before I moved to LA. How about that? Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Grace of God, because wow. I almost failed that <laughs> test with the excessive maneuvers in my parallel parking. <laughs> yeah. But uh, when I moved to LA, it wasn't until this globe, the pandemic did have some fruits because I did realize I use my car so much. It's such a car driven city. Mm. Like I would go to the grocery store, which is like five minutes from my house 
in my car yeah. when I could just take a cart and walk there, right? But you kind of feel like an idiot. It, it, the way the city is set mm -hmm. up, and I don't know LA that well, but there's sometimes where it's like, it seems very dangerous to walk on these <laughs> sidewalks. Well, there was people are almost surprised why you would even use it. Yeah, well, there's a song from the 80s. It's very popular. It's called Nobody Walks in LA, okay? Mm, That's the name okay. of the song. And okay. it's a very catchy tune, but it's the truth. It's like people look at you like, why are you walking? Mm. Like, whoa. <laughs> like, but... I find that like, I just, I just, I love to walk. So little things, little changing little things, like where can you, instead of taking the car, can you walk to the grocery store? Can you walk to get your, your coffee? Can you walk to do this, that, and the third, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's the little things that count at the end. And here's an interesting study that came out sometime last year that just walking 8,000 steps a day or even closer to, if you can get up to 11,000 helps people who are obese to lose weight consistently and mm. keep it off. Like just that little walking, right? Didn't say to run, didn't say to do hours at the gym, walking eight to 11,000 steps a day. And that doesn't actually take too long. That's maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, if you're a little slower mm -hmm. of walking, less than like two miles, you know? And when you just make these things consistent, even if you're not doing it for exercise in and of itself, if you're just timing and you all of our phones and our devices now have pedometers on it and if you look at the end of the day and say oh i only got three thousand steps in how can i how can i get 3500 instead mm. how can i get four thousand in the next two weeks or so little things like that can make incredible changes in the body that's really helpful i i was watching some fella talking about how much he works out every day how much he meditates every day maybe <laughs> you've seen this dude he was a black guy with no hair that's all i know is about it david him. goggins yeah that, that sounds like him yeah I'm not in any way criticizing this man, but I think I might end up criticizing, maybe I will end up criticizing him. He seems like an amazing dude. Seems like a very, um, why don't we look him up? Cause I want to make Probably sure. David him. Goggins is actually, has a really inspiring story. Okay. Yeah. David G. Oh, G G I N S. Let's see. Yeah, I think this this is definitely him. So I'm not about to criticize him, but I just had this thought the other day. And and, and listen, I, I watched like a three minute video on him, so I'm not pretending mm -hmm. I understand all that he has to say. Um, but the little I heard was that he meditates for two hours a day. The first thing he does, he gets up and he runs, then he hits the gym, and then, and all that sounds great if you don't have a wife and children. Like, mm -hmm. how do you how? I'm afraid that we're setting that up as mm -hmm. this is what you ought to be doing if you're a serious person right. who's serious about their health. But I'm also like, well, what if I wanted to have kids? How inconvenient would that be? I'm sorry, mm. dad's got an hour and a half more to meditate <laughs> and then I got to hit the gym because I want to be super committed. Um, feel free to push back. And I don't know yeah, much no, about this fella. I, so. I think what, here's the thing with this. This is where the social media stuff goes into impact if effect because it's like, the people who are the motivators are, of course, going to be the more extreme ends yes, of things because point. you have to be at least the person that inspires someone mm -hmm. to be like, like if this is the pinnacle of what you could be doing. Fair enough. That's but I find it more important to say, OK, listen, guys, this is what I do all day. I edit videos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I sit and talk on YouTube. I write diets for people. This is what I do. This is how I've cultivated my life. And so my whole life is is really based around what time do I want to get up in the morning and actually do this stuff, right? Mm. And no, not the majority of people don't have that luxury. So I try to make it at least my responsibility to, to break down, okay, this is the extreme of it. But if you just have five minutes to sit down and meditate and pray, that's five minutes that you didn't allocate to before. And once you get that five minutes down, mm -hmm. maybe you can get 10 minutes, maybe you can 15 minutes. Maybe what you need to do is sit down and look at your schedule. And I tell this to my clients, block it off. Like, I, I get a little extreme sometimes when I need to for myself because there will be times where I'm super disciplined mm -hmm. and there'll be times where I'm like sitting in my bed staring at the wall like, oh my God, what is my life? Right. So I need to like get up and write a.m. five o'clock a.m. I wake up. Now, this is a, this is the extreme here. I have a two hour time block where I meditate and pray two hours, five to seven. Oh, right. Beautiful. Then seven o'clock in the morning, sometimes depends on the day, I'll go to morning mass. I'd like to go to morning mass maybe like three or four times a week, mm -hmm. right? So I'll say if I go to the eight o'clock mass, then I make time to go ahead and get that in. Um, but then I also have my workout then day, like literally like work, eat, <laughs> pray, you know, walk in the park, whatever, you know, it's I have to put it down just to get it done. And sometimes I feel like telling people, hey, Sometimes you have to get that discipline. You've got to write it out. You've got to make it a standing appointment to mm -hmm. make it fit for your lifestyle. 
you don't have two hours, you got five minutes, right? Yes, right. Do what you can in that and time. And to be fair, that's what this fella would say for sure. I'm sure I'm if you sure. asked and him, I like, really I got eight kids and I, mm-hmm. like, I got a job, he'd be like, well, what can you do? Yeah. I, I, I keep repeating this line from Jordan Peterson because I think it's excellent. He says, what's something you could do that you would do that would make your life better? Mm-hmm. And it's that would do that I think is so critical because there's all sorts of things you could do. Right. But you won't because right. you're a big, fat, lazy slob who's never committed <laughs> to anything for longer than five days. So why don't you be realistic about what's something you could actually do and that you would do and then do that. Right, um, right, right. And, yeah. and that comes down to, again, the things that the industry doesn't talk about. That's changing behavior. That's changing mm-hmm. patterns. That's changing habits. That's changing mindset, right? And if you can really realize that that's half the battle, because a lot of people, you can give them a diet and they'll follow it, sure, you know, or you can get them on a training program, they'll do it for like a week or two, but then the discipline to continue isn't yeah. there. And the accountability is the other thing for a lot of people that mm-hmm. that's missing. So a lot of people, when they're first starting out, you may not need a trainer forever, but the first few months or so that you're starting out on a program where you're trying to solidify this new habit, yeah. 30, 60, 90 days or whatever, maybe for some people a little bit more, you need someone to, that you have to report to. And if you can't afford that, is there a friend? Is there, mm-hmm. you know, a spouse or, you know, someone in your circle that you can say, hey, do you mind if I send you my 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 weight every Friday or every other Friday? Or yeah. if I report into you, like using your resources in that way is so helpful. But you, a lot of people need a community. The greatest um, exercise, I, I don't know what you think about this, but I had a great community in North Atlanta where I used to live. It was a CrossFit Gym, mm-hmm. And it was the best. Mm-hmm. And it was the best because the people were the best. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dawson CrossFit, if anyone is interested. <laughs> uh, absolutely just amazing. It's like it's a, CrossFit gyms and coffee shops are similar in that they are either run by devout evangelical Christians or <laughs> raging leftists. <laughs> oh, you notice yeah. that about coffee yeah. shops? It's rarely, <laughs> uh, this is, you know. But I just loved it so much because you would get there, it was this communal, you would do this thing together. But Yeah, I think that we must have the raging leftists in, the, in LA. So, uh, but um, this is just a little chide. But yeah. yeah, I think that <laughs> CrossFit is good. I mean, there's, I think that CrossFit is is not necessarily for everyone mm-hmm. because you have to have a certain level of um, technique and know how to like perform these like like really Olympic oh, Olympic lifts. lifts yeah unless very, you, unless you've got a coach that's really good about working with you and helping right. you not do things that you don't know how to do yet right and you're moving through with like functional speed and all this other stuff so it's really it can be very tricky if you have injuries and stuff like that but for those who are used to working out that need that extra I, I used to go to a, a box that was like yep. over by me and it was a lot of fun it was great yeah. you know um but i think that you know it's it's it, uh, there was a point where like CrossFit was like the rage. And I was like, yeah. oh, you got to do CrossFit. Like, and I'm not really one to say that like one form of exercise is the end all be all. It's like whatever gravitates to you, mm-hmm. like with the exception of yoga, people don't do yoga anymore. Okay, stop it. But anyway, <laughs> that was a hard one for me, like giving up the yoga. Tell me, tell me about that. Well, you know, that's what happens when you get into these Catholic circles and you start questioning things, right? And then you start hearing, wait, the Catholic church says, what about like new age spirituality and stuff? And then you're realizing like all this <laughs> yoga which is fantastic for the body, right? It's great, it feels great. But for me, it came down to realizing that it's like an appropriation of somebody else's religion and culture, right? It's like you're, 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 the positions and some of the things that you're mm-hmm. doing are, are, are literally calling upon their, their gods. I, I interviewed it's, a yoga teacher. I was going to bring that up. Could you put that in the description for people who want to watch it? Because I had like a three-hour conversation mm-hmm. with this fella who actually, yeah, lived in Buddhist temples. Yeah, and, he made a really great point. And it was what you just said. It's not the positions. It's when you name the positions that Mm -hmm. you call on the spirits. So then what would your advice be or what did you do to do something similar? I mean, if people are finding Mm -hmm. a lot of help through yoga, what are they to do? Nothing? Right. Well, that's... And and then I think people who are ignorant about yoga and how much it helps people will just say, well, why not just go for a walk? You're like, that guy's never been helped by yoga, clearly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's 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 a double fold thing because as someone who's a facilitator of exercise i can literally create anything right so this is where for me this this step away from yoga has been something within the last like 
almost year now, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know the last time I went to a yoga class. And that was hard because I really love yoga with this one particular good friend and teacher of mine in um, LA. Um, But I said to myself, well, let me start stretching. I know how to stretch. I know flexibility. I know how to do this stuff with the, without necessarily looking at a specific position and saying that, oh, this is like, you know, when we're calling upon the god Shiva or whatever, you know, it's like, <laughs> can we stretch without doing that? Sure. Okay. Right? Yeah, let's you do can. That and it's like, <laughs> they don't own the nasus, the, 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 mo- yeah, the motion and the movement of the body. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, I talk about this with modesty enough that maybe this is like a, a, another conversation we get into. Whereas like, we are so like especially in christian culture we are so taken with whatever is of god's giving it right over to the devil right it's like oh it's yoga that's a position in yoga and you can't do it anymore because it's owned by the hindus it's like, even no, if it's in not. your cupboard you are reaching for a can of beans <laughs> and you accidentally you will be possessed right. by Satan. it's like yeah it's like no that's not how it works you're giving the body over to to yeah, satan and yeah. that's not, not how his. it works yeah. right yeah so that's the theology of the body right there giving mm-hmm. you everything over to god the wrinkling of the he talks about the paper like uh christopher yeah. west you know like taking sin and crumbling it up right yeah. or crumbles the nature but anyhow like so for me it's like okay so i know how to stretch i know how to instruct with stretching without necessarily turning it over to to yoga in itself so yeah. on my end i'm trying to create content now that, that will go be, into that will so feed into that yeah I don't know this. What's the difference between Pilates and yoga? What is Pilates? I hear <laughs> well, people say this. Yeah. Word. So yoga in itself is uh, is a, uh, well, I'm going to name it what it is. It's a Hindu practice of yeah, stretching, for right? Sure. Yeah. But P- Pilates was a, is a technique which was created by Joseph Pilates, which, I mean, he was more into body conditioning, gymnastics and stuff. And it became very popular with dancers. And it's all about more core strength and conditioning. It has nothing to do with spirituality. It has nothing to do with anybody's religion or co-opting that. Mm -hmm. It's all about strengthening the body through, through motion and through core strength more specifically. And then I mean, of course there's like different parts of Pilates that starts on the floor work, then it goes on different apparatus and stuff like that. So it's, it's actually, I like Pilates a lot. It's not necessarily for stretching, but, definitely for strengthening Gee, that would be so helpful if you came up with something like that uh, yeah for, for catholics who are like all right well i've been really helped by this what's the alternative see now here's this is the funny part are you ready for this mm-hmm. so what did i tell you guys i did in the beginning of all this i just got on the floor and i just prayed to god you know john 15 lord live, uh, live in me i'm living in you i need you to just speak to me whatever you want me to tell your people just give it to me right mm-hmm. catholic channel starts taking off and i'm yeah. like i was talking about this though god we were gonna <laughs> But here we are now where I start to realize you're a funny man. Like you punk my life like crazy because now here's the idea. Who who out there is creating like cardio rosaries, right? Like for Catholics to do, anyone. right? right. Yeah. So, and then here's the opportunity. I start to think to myself recently, like, okay, how can I facilitate doing more fitness-based things that are exercise-based stretching that's for people who want to release themselves of yoga and all Mm -hmm. that other stuff oh here's a great alternative and let's go ahead and get down and get it what's going to be interesting is to see whether or not these two channels merge or (laughs) where do you put a video like that uh like does that go on your exercise channel well listen they already know over on the exercise channel i was like look guys uh you I can't ever get rid of that other channel because there's so much history of my Mm. entire life because I started it when I moved to Los Angeles and I, right before I started doing, um, competing, like I have videos of me. If you go back and watch my earliest videos, it's like skinny little Roxy when she was still like on the precipice of quitting ballet and going more into fitness. I was like, super tiny i had a like, uh-huh. big head you know and so i watch these videos i'm like whoa like mind-blowing so i can't get rid of it because so much of my history is there and there's so many people that have been following me all these years it's like mm-hmm. we're going back about 10 11 12 years now right so um i i i'm just honest on my channel i'm like hey guys look you guys have seen me through all phases of my mm-hmm. life and roxy 3.0 4.0 well, this is like five now listen <laughs> Crisis in my life in a major way. I never talked about this ever. I never talked about religion. For me, religion was always over here and everything else was over here. But I cannot hold in anymore that all of this, these worlds are colliding yeah. and I'm bringing this here. You don't have to believe what I believe. I'm not trying to evangelize to you, but if this changes your life, fantastic. Mm. But we're bringing God into this. We're bringing spirituality into this. And this is what it is. So they already know. Yeah. They already know. I, some of them are probably watching it right now. This right now, because I shared this on that channel, okay. this interview. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So, <laughs> how what do you? How did you get into bodybuilding? When did when did that cross your mind that hey, I want to do that? 
first of all, what uh, is bodybuilding, and and how did you decide to get into it? Yeah, see, uh, my well, I'm redefining bodybuilding in a way, um, but bodybuilding would be the spectator sport of conditioning the body and trying to get your body to like this absolute apex of perfection when it comes to the balance of muscularity, symmetry, and leanness, and mm. then to step on a stage and to ask a panel of judges to judge you against everyone else to see who would be wow. the clear winner. It's a great vanity. I love it, right? It's so ego-driven, but it doesn't have to yeah. be that way. You know, because- I, I remember a seminarian telling me that he was watching this bodybuilding contest mm -hmm. and he was just judging. This is in his own words. I was just sitting there, <laughs> just slinging judgments at these people. And then the guy who won said, I want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, yeah. and, then, and then the uh, seminarian was like, shame on me. So well, yeah, it doesn't yeah, have to be that. There's a lot of bodybuilders who are actually very much spiritually connected. A lot of conservatives as well, you know, like, so it's a very surprising uh, world in many ways. And it doesn't have to be wrapped up in lust. I think that like just the way our culture is and the way that fitness has been going has been getting hypersexual, of course, with mm. social media. And there can be the outwards appearance because of the fact that you're stepping on a stage, you have very little clothes on, you're showing off your body, that can be seen as lustfulness. And that's what a lot of people who have found my channel by way of the Catholic uh, you know, streams they're like, they come to my other channel and the first video they see is me in a bikini, like posing on bodies like, oh, you're so immodest. Oh, mm -hmm. Lord, what is going on? Excuse me. But um, I, I'm just kind of like, well, that's not what it is at all. Yeah. Right. It's not it's not it's not hooked up in that. And I don't see the human body. So when you talk about bodybuilding to me, with all the studying that I've done of the body, I just see it as perf like I hate the word perfecting, but just like taking this creation and how can we like bring it to the absolute apex of what it can be for us individually gen and genetically right and so i don't wrap it all up in sin and lust it's just show we were born naked right so how can you how can you really take this creation and just make it amazingly healthy fast strong you know but so. i mean at the condition you were in mm -hmm. should any woman ever be in that condition i mean i've i've heard that women can you know exercise and get into such a shape that they stop mm -hmm. menstruating yeah that doesn't sound healthy yeah no it absolutely sh should so yeah, then no, is yeah. that the peak of of female uh yeah it's not and okay. that's why that's why me rebranding my channel as redefining bodybuilding has been mm -hmm. important because the stage is a fleeting thing no one can hold that condition man or women when you're on that stage mm. it's only for a short amount of time that you can actually hold that peak conditioning before it just goes all downhill from there right you train for weeks and months and years to reach this one 10 second 10 minute block of time in your life where you'll look like that and then it's over so for women it's not healthy it's not natural at all because once our body fat starts to go down to a certain level, you stop menstruating, your mm -hmm. hormones get thrown off, like all things, really bad things can happen and have happened to plenty of women in the sport. So it's not something that should be done all the time. I mean, if you decide to compete, mm -hmm. you really have to think about the ramifications of what you're doing to your body, how you're doing it, whether you have the genetic capacity, because just like there are basketball players, football players, musicians, great minds who are gifted to be able to do those things. Not everyone can sit at a piano and be like, you know, Beethoven, mm -hmm. right? But and it's the same thing with with bodybuilding. Not everyone can just because you go to a gym and work out doesn't mean that you will ever be able to step on a, an Olympia stage or a pro level stage. That's genetics at work now. Of course, we know there's some steroids in there for some people, but a lot of people. Does testing but, catch all of that? Testing what? Ain't no testing. There's no testing in bodybuilding. Not, okay. There's testing in the nat in the natural organizations, right? But the truth of the matter is the biggest organization in the world is the IFBB, which is my federation. Mm -hmm. And their amateur level is the NPC. And the reason why they're so big is because back in the day when bodybuilding started to become a thing, okay, Eugene Sandow is the is the father of modern bodybuilding. And the International Federation of Bodybuilding was he like this one of his first shows was like that was like the federation that they created, right? And so that federation grew and became popular because it was like the only thing that was out there. And then when the media started coming in with, you had the weeders with the the all the magazines, Muscle and Fitness, Muscle yeah. and Fitness, Her Shape, all of these, you know, flex. 
the only way back in the day, this is before social media, that you can get into the media was through the IFBB. The only way to get to the Olympia stage is through the IFBB and all of the greats came from the IFBB. So this was not, this is not a tested organization though. Okay. They tried to do it at some point when they wanted to have it go through the Olympics. Mm. That obviously failed miserably. And that's why bodybuilding has never made it to the Olympic level. They tried to get it in, but it couldn't get it with yeah. all the, yeah. The this test. is all news to me. This yeah. is probably like secondhand, you know this stuff in and out, but I, I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, totally. So in that respect, <laughs> um, there is no testing because if they tried to test people in that specific organization, everybody would fail. That's not what's winning shows. Wow. So my dichotomy as a professional is like, okay, I don't want to do all that stuff. I don't, I didn't get into bodybuilding for the drugs. How did I get into the sport? So you asked that question. So I used to watch television. Now this is going to date me. So <laughs> when I used to watch TV and back in the day, okay, around like in the Saturday morning cartoons would go off. They would show bodybuilding on TV. Like okay. I was like, maybe, I don't know, maybe five or so, four or five, maybe younger. And then I'm seeing like, I, I'm watching, I don't know, Looney Tunes. And all of a sudden you start seeing these people with these muscles. And I was just like, wow, that's so crazy. And then there were women. Mm -hmm. And I was like, they all look like the cartoon characters of the day. He-Man, yes, She-Ra, yes. you know, the Thundercats. And yes. of course, you know, I was watching that, you know, oh. Wonder Woman. Like, I was like, wow, they look like superheroes. I want to look like that. Mm -hmm. So as I started getting older, I started to watch, it's like, I found out that there were different divisions. So they had the the fitness division. So the girls are all doing the tumbling and the routines. And, you know, me and dancer, I'm like, I could do that. I could so do that. And that's how I kind of got into it. Just mm -hmm. always stuck. I would stay up really late at night and wake up super early in the morning and watch these fitness shows on, on ESPN. They were like working out on the beach. I was like, I want to do that. So fitness has always been that er undercurrent in my life. So when I got into it, it was just like, it was just natural. It was just something that I felt like I was called to do, quote unquote. And um, so that's how I got into it. And I, so I didn't, I never got into it because I wanted to be a mass monster on all these drugs and doing mm. all these steroids and all these things. And when I was faced with, okay, you made it to the Olympia, all right? And it's probably your lucky shot because of the fact that your division was new and they were looking for a softer look. They wanted the girls to look more natural. So that's great. You had a great shot, but now this is the direction it's going. Mass monsters, mm. more size, more dryness, more conditioning you got to take this drug, this drug, this drug. And I was like, yeah, okay, mm. I'm out. So that's why I stepped away. But like. What kind of studies have been done on uh, the consequences of these drugs? Not very many. I think I recently saw something that I had saved to bookmark that was kind of in line with this, like the effects of, of steroids on professional bodybuilders. But we are seeing again, just like we talked about how society is reaping you know, it's you reap what you sow. Well, honey, it's reaping right now because mm. the there the number of bodybuilders that have died in the last year. We just lost two major bodybuilders, particularly Mr. Olympia himself. Um, uh, uh, why is his name? My Sean Roden. That's crazy. Sean mm -hmm. Roden. He's one of my favorites. Died recently. Go look him up. Had a heart attack. Massive heart attack. Dead. Forty How something years old. Wow. Okay. Another body bodybuilder died, um, Cedric McMillan. That one brought a tear to my eye because Cedric has always been a re really fantastic person. These are people I wow. cross paths with as a professional. Man, he's died. jacked. Yeah, that yeah, is nuts. You know, so we ha there's so many more. There's so many more. And and the reason given was... heart attacks. A lot of them heart attacks. Um, some. But some... you think it's because of steroids? Well, Possibly. when you think about a guy who carries around 300 pounds on a daily basis, like that's not normal for anyone. Mm -hmm. When you see the guys that are out there right now, three, 350, like huge, that's not normal for the heart, Oof. you know, and the, the- I find it very unattractive. Yeah. I'm not saying I'm right to, it's just personally, subjectively, I find it just very off-putting. Like I'm seeing somebody with a body deformity. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's terrible. It's getting worse. You know, um, it's ruining the sport. Arnold Schwarzenegger talks about this a lot. There's a new division called classic bodybuilding, which harkens back to Arnold's day mm. and what the classic bodybuilders of that time look like. And that's doing a lot better, yeah. you know, than the mass monsters are right now. I mean, Mr. Olympia will always be there. You know, people come to see that. 
but it's yeah. not healthy. When you've got these bodybuilders over the last couple of years, every time you look around, somebody 40 something year old bodybuilder dropping dead, that's not normal, mm. you know? And so I don't know what's happening with the industry or if anyone's really doing or saying anything about it. Um, it's just one of those things. It's just, I don't know if there's ever going to be a solution. What, what was your thoughts on, uh, is it the liver king when that all broke? I've never followed him before, but like in looking at his pictures, I'm like, yeah, he looks like he's like, takes like trend for breakfast. Are you kidding me? Like he's up there popping yes, himself every day okay. with some kind of hard like drugs. I mean, he looked fantastic. <laughs> Jacked up. I mean, yeah. When I look at him. Come that, on. That, that's uh, not natural. Come on. But he I mean, looks better to me than that Mr. Olympia. Like that looks... <laughs> I, see, that's funny. I guess somebody who's never done steroids, who's never really been into <laughs> even exercise, let alone bodybuilding. I guess for people like me, it's hard to look at someone and go, "Okay, that guy's on steroids." But you can, you that's can do why that. Derek from More Plates, More Dates, the guy who yeah broke that story, was so adamant about breaking the Liver King story because he was like really upset. He was like that. Mm. He, it really bugs him that people pretend people get an audience and then pretend they're natural because he thinks it's unhealthy for society to think that certain physiques are natural when they're clearly not. And this fella claims not to use steroids, right? Whoever Liver King did. No, no, not he, him. More, more plates, more dates. Fella. He used to look at the size of him. Yeah. Th that picture is probably from when he was on gear. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't I mean, use look gear at those anymore. shoulders. That's, that's definitely like, and, so at some point Andrew, did he Andrew decide shoulders. <laughs> he doesn't use gear anymore. I think he's on TRT. And that's it. What is that? Like uh, hormone replacement therapy, which is not that it's different when you're using these exogenous hormones to balance yourself out, to get yourself to like where peak conditioning would be for at your peak. You know, when you're like a virile, like 25 year old guy, and your hormones are all great and fantastic. Then you're like 40 something. And it's like all of a sudden you have like this stomach that won't go away. A lot of that's the increase of estrogen in the body for men, the decrease of testosterone. And so balancing that out is really important. Same thing for women, you know, I'm terrified to take so, testosterone. So correct and me if I'm wrong. Let me just really quickly it's say why, because that's a weird thing just to throw out there and not. I know men take testosterone, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Am I right in thinking that to take testosterone would likely result in a stronger libido? It does. I do not want that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I want the opposite of that. Well, that your is what testosterone levels are probably normal, but for some okay. guys who struggle, that's what I was going to say. Know? That's why it's considered natural, right? Because you're only allowed to take as much test as would bring you up to mm -hmm. what is considered like a healthy level. Right, exactly. Right? Okay, yeah, exactly. that's what I thought. So, exactly. so you can take test, you can be on TRT. And it be considered natural because you're not like okay you're not pinning test up to above a natural level right exactly so that's really what one of the biggest differences are and I think that if you're doing it for optimal health then I mean I think that you'd have to ask yourself ethically if that's something that one that you would want to do yeah. you know I think for a lot of people it alleviates the 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 natural process of aging because that's nothing but the body slowing down and you know, decaying into what we're all going to be, which is dead at some yeah, point, you yeah. know? Um, but whether you're Mr. Olympia or right. Absolutely. Mr. Potato cat, uh, couch potato. You know? <laughs> it's, it's, absolutely. It's coming for all of us. Yeah. Um, would you mind if we hit up some questions here? Yeah, I haven't read go. these questions ahead of time, so I can't <laughs> vouch for them, but they just came through here. Uh, let's see. This comes from our local supporter. Uh, Mitchell Moles says, my sister competes professionally in bikinis. My family is super worried about her soul because it's perceived as immodest. Can you glorify God through bikini slash fitness competitions? I mean, we've been talking about that. But is there anything else you want to say? Well, yeah, yeah. Um, so bikini has always been kind of the bane of the existence of all of us in the bodybuilding world because we just be like... What are they even looking for? Like, it's all about the butt. Like, it really is. You turn around. That's that's the show. Like, that's turn it. around. It's just the butt. Like, just turn, yeah, it's like, turn around, girls. Walk to the back. Let's go. Ah. You know, so it's it, that's the moral dilemma that I was talking about, right? That's the division. I was like, okay, if I'm going to be natural, that's where I probably fall. But I don't really feel like that's what I want to do. Because the posing is very suggestive. It's very, you know, it's very much about playing the carnality of the woman's body and her mm -hmm. sensuality. So uh, will it... Will it damn her soul? That's a whole different thing. But I mean, what it about is in danger. What about that? Uh, in could be because it could because to be a bikini pro means that you have to put yourself out there. Now, this is the difference between back in the day and today's time. You don't have to worry about being in any, anybody's federation. You don't have to compete mm. to be a fitness model, fitness star or whatever, you know. 
you can just go on your social media and garner, you know, a, a following and an audience and boom, now you have sponsors and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, you have to have the popularity. What works, particularly for women? Being half naked, putting your 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 butt in the camera, doing all this kind of thing, you know, too much cleavage. That's what gets the eyeballs. Yeah. That's what gains the following. So you go into this pattern of, if I want to be successful, I got to do what everybody else is doing. This is what everybody else is doing. So now this is what, it becomes that cycle, right? So it's really hard to separate the two. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what division you're in. You can be a, a, a bodybuilder, like of the biggest proportions. You know, I have some friends who are top level female bodybuilders. I'm talking about the big, big girls. Mm. And I love them to death, but some of their stuff is very sexual. You know, mm. what they put out there because that's the expectation. So um, unless she sees it like that, is she's not going to pull out of it. She has to have yeah. that awakening for herself, unfortunately. Heidi says, being black, Catholic, and a female, and being active on social media with great content, there has to be a lot of people pressuring you to completely represent each of those categories. Spiritually, how do you maintain your sense of self, and that's a great question, mm -hmm. and authenticity when different camps are fighting over you? Amen. That's a great question, actually. And... I've always been the type of person to beat to my own drum. And I think that is the one thing that like is my saving grace. Like I never want to do what everybody else is doing. I never wanted to be about, about, about trends. I always wanted to be about being against the grain and standing for what I believe and what my thought process is. So I think that helps a lot because for me, you can tell me, well, you need to talk about this. And I've had people say that to me. Remember I said that earlier, it's mm -hmm. like people say, yo, you have to stand up for black people and do this. I'm like, no, I don't. Because that's not me. And so I just, I pray a lot. And at the end of the day, I just decide, I decide what's going to be on my channel and that's it. Y'all ain't going to come on, y'all ain't going to come on my channel and tell me what to talk about. Okay. That's what we're not going to do today. So that's it. All right. That's good. Uh, Suzuki says, hi, Matt. Don't know if she's talked about this, but in her experience with evangelization to youth, has she undertaken different methods of evangelization to people of different communities, race, uh, racial, ethnic, cultural? Um, no, honestly, because this has this was not my plan or idea. This was God's idea. I just put the videos out and then next thing you know, I'm on Pines with Aquinas in Ohio. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I haven't really gotten to that point yet. But I think that I'm at that that um that like point in my own life where things surrounding like marriage, family, relationships, dating, children, like society, like that's what really um inspires me so i speak to that and and i feel like within i i just like to connect other catholics that are looking for that community as well and i think that's what works well with my young adult ministry mm -hmm. or the what i do within my in my church so i haven't really thought beyond that because it just really has been coming to me as of recent so this is probably slightly different, but I think sometimes we Catholics find a particular devotion that really strikes us, that means a lot to us, or a particular way of praying that's really helped us. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of make that unintentionally the litmus test of what it means to look like a good Catholic. Mm -hmm. And so we come up with this like mold that worked for us, and then we just try to put that on people as opposed to giving them the freedom to assess these different devotions and gravitating to what form of prayer that they'd like to. Mm -hmm. I, I obviously clearly recognize that there are boundaries to that, but um, I think that's something that Catholics sometimes fall into. Like you yeah. ha your, your prayer life, your your life has to look like this if you want to be a good Catholic. Right. And I mean, th I think that's what makes my, and this is what I've been told and what's been shared with me. That's what makes my, my presence very refreshing is that, and I will say for myself, it's like when I was coming back into, okay, I need to have more Catholic influence in my life and, and people to follow and look look for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not going to sit here and say that I didn't say, look up, okay, black Catholics and see what would come up. And I didn't see anything or anyone that necessarily looked like me. I found some really great women. But to me, it was always like this two camps. Yeah. I feel, I feel like there's like the young, like ingenue, like, fresh face like oh my gosh i love life and i'm so young and life is and that's like that one uh -huh. and then there's like oh i'm married i got like my my five to ten catholic kids and my wonderful husband and i'm like i'm looking at both these camps like yo i missed that boat you know what am i gonna do here ladies yeah. so i think that me and then just this presentation i mean who can who comes on your show your your show with a loud shirt like it's this beautiful. you know like I mean, <laughs> all this energy yeah. And I, I, I like to say I'm the prodigal daughter in so many ways. And mm. I'm that in between that it's like, okay, 
I'm the one that you're, these are the people that like may come into their faith that everybody's looking at like, you don't fit in here. Are you even Catholic? Like you, you don't want to question your devotion because you don't fit that box. Yeah. So I think that's what my appeal is, is because I don't fit the box quite there yet. And I think know? that's like to go back to YouTube advice, to be yourself is so key. Just mm-hmm. to actually be yourself, to not try to cater to a particular audience. Uh, it ends up being helpful because there turns out to actually be a lot of people who do fit that mold. Mm-hmm. So you might think, well, this is just me being kind of unique and weird and shenanigan-y. Uh, <laughs> but then there's people who are like, I, I feel exactly like that. And I couldn't, you know. Yeah, so, absolutely. I think there's yeah. a place for everyone and everyone deserves a voice. And and I mean, the, the word representation is a big thing in our culture today. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just feeling like, wow, there's somebody that I can relate to. Now, let's yeah. not excuse these other you know, the other two uh, types that I talked about are not important because they are right. And everyone might move through some kind of phase. I mean, there was a point where I was there where I was like the young, like, Oh my gosh, I feel so great. I think I'm going to be, I'm discerning being a nun or a wife. Like Mm -hmm. that was really a thing. Or I'm discerning between being a nun or a ballerina. That was me. right? So you have that. (laughs) That's pretty cool. (laughs) (laughs) And then you have, you know, later on, I, I aspire to be like, you know, the woman who's has the wonderful Catholic husband, beautiful Catholic children. We're living this life. Mm -hmm. but I'm not there yet, you know? And so it's like, all right, guys, here's how I'm figuring this out. And I'm past 20 something. So like, this is, this is really real, you know, let's get down and figure this out together. So, yeah. yeah. Do me a favor. Tell me if any more questions come in on the live chat. So I think we have one more question here. I'm just pulling it up on locals on my phone because Mm -hmm. my computer did something weird. Um, no, not, not really. (laughs) <laughs> There's some a couple of questions, but they're just re-asking things we already talked about. So right, go back see. and watch the whole episode. That's the answer to your question. <laughs> All right, where was it? We just had one more, and I wanted to get at it. Get at it. Get at it. But now I can't. Oh, there it is. All right, let's see. Um, this comes from Gabriel. He says, are there any saints that you feel a special devotion to? How do you incorporate the saints into your prayer? Interesting. That's a great question to tell you the truth. Like I just, I've asked myself this question a number of times and I, I, I have alluded to this over and over about the blessed mother I and mean, she's not necessarily a saint. She's like the greatest woman. Yeah, it's yeah. right. Exactly. But I have this particular draw to our lady of Guadalupe actually. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it is about her specifically, but I just lo- like this the medal that I have here was given to me for Christmas Mm. and this is our lady of Guadalupe. Right. And so I just have this draw to her, like the blessed mother to me is just the most amazing form. I mean, just example of femininity and surrender. And so when I think about who would I want to emulate most and who do I trust most, it just always comes back to her. And I've looked at other saints. There are really great saints out there, but it's just like, you know, even my own saint, my confirmation saint is Saint Cecilia, mm-hmm. right? Because of the, she's a patron saint of musicians. And to mm-hmm. me, that was like an artist and a dancer. So that was it. But my draw is still to Our Lady of Guadalupe. And I have not, I live on the West Coast and I have not been to Mexico City yet. Maybe I can go there for my my honeymoon. Hi, hubby. Where are you? <laughs> Reach out, let us know. So anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I love Our Lady Guadalupe. There's something very beautiful about that image. Yeah. It's just, you want to keep looking at it. It doesn't feel like it gets old. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> well, we've we've got your link to your YouTube channel in the description. And I said we need to hit at least 10,000 subscribers on your okay. channel by the end of the week. Okay. So if y'all are watching right now, <laughs> click that link, subscribe to Roxy's channel, check out the good stuff that she's 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 got up there. And, and what's what's next? I mean, you've got these fitness things. Is that the, yeah. the next thing you're working on? Well, I you know what? Fitness I'm, rosaries. I have such a calling on my heart. I don't know what it is, but I really would love to get into like motivational speaking, keynote speaking, oh my motivational gosh. speaking. You'd like be terrific at that. <laughs> yeah. Like I really want to be able to just touch the lives of people beyond just the YouTube channels, you know, yeah. and, and I love the stage. And that's the thing about life, right? Is that when I was five years old, I knew that my calling, my calling is to inspire others to greatness. Now I said that at five, I don't know how wow. that came to be, yeah. but I just knew that was what I was supposed to be doing. Yep. So all the things that I've been doing has been chasing that, like, okay, this is what I said, dancing. Oh, that inspires people acting that in fitness that inspires people. But now that I'm here all these years later, even about how I ended up being a Catholic, right? Cause that's a whole story in of itself. But like, it all is leading to this this 
thing in me that's like, okay, that was preparation. You got the stage presence, you got the personality, you have the inspired story, you have the talent. Now let's put this together for God and push this forward. So for me, I feel like I really have this calling to do like, um, maybe do retreats or, but really to be on stage and talk to people across no, the country. You, That's what I'd love you to do. Absolutely. Have that <laughs> calling. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For what it's worth. Yeah. You definitely do. And yeah. you're amazing at it. So if people are watching right now and maybe they want to book you to speak at a retreat, do you have a website that they yeah, can go to, to yeah. contact you? Absolutely. My re my website, which I'm still working on, I had to rebrand it because I wasn't <sighs> using my, my named website, roxybeckles.com. Yeah. However, the best way to contact me is Roxy, R O X I E at roxybeckles.com, R-O-X-I-E. B E C K L E S dot com. Are you afraid of getting an avalanche of emails? No, send them all in. Can we you put know, that in the description? Obviously, then? well, I should. Whoever is seeing mm. this, wait, well, hold on. Okay, whoever don't put is it. seeing, no, 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 Back you up. can do this. Wait, wait, Leave I got, I just got to say this real quick. <laughs> so, whoever is seeing this video right now, you're like, I emailed you and you didn't email me back in the last like week or so. I have been so busy, but you can do it now. I'm good because I had to just prep my mind for this moment. Yeah. And I was just so, so. Anyway, people probably like side eye and like she don't answer her email. I'll get back to you <laughs> today, actually. But Roxy Beckles at Rox, uh, Roxy at Roxy Beckles. Yeah, we'll put it in the description. If you do that, because that way we'll get the spelling yeah. right and people can check it out. Because yeah, exactly. I'm sure there's so many yeah, people who you. would benefit. <laughs> um, um, cool. Yeah, so I would say? love that. Nothing. Oh. Yeah, that's Just awesome. Chilling. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you so much for thank coming you. all this way from Los Angeles. And Amen. So LA, huh? Sticking with that? No, no, no. We're not <laughs> sticking with LA. We're just there because it's warm. I, you oh, know, I, I don't have a husband yet. And if he said that we're leaving, I'm gone. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, I'm not married to LA. My, my family's back East. LA is just, uh, it's just a holding point for right now. And are they still in Brooklyn? Yeah. Do you, do they like it? Yeah. I mean, my family is yeah. like born and raised. How, has it changed is... much after the lockdowns? Because I'm well, afraid to go there because I just I have a feeling that everyone's probably still in masks. <laughs> I mean, you yeah, know, honestly, still masks, masks don't bother me as much as people who insist on still wearing the mask outside <laughs> with it under their nose. That really bothers me because I'm like either commit or, or take it, it all. Off. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, as I saw somebody still wearing a mask alone in their car the other day. Yeah. yeah. And I thought about running them off the road. <laughs> no, that's not very charitable. Come on, Thursday. What the hell? <laughs> Over, no, I mean, I I can imagine people are still masking because they still mask in L.A., mm -hmm. you know. Um, New York is New York is not the same New York that I grew up with. And that's because uh, New York is an immigrant city. It was built on the backs of mm -hmm. immigrants, right? And you had people coming all through Ellis Island. You had all these people from, like, the old, the old country, you know, mm -hmm. the mother countries. And they bought their customs, they bought their cultures with them. And these are the things that everyone loves about New York. You go to this oh, section, absolutely. it's you know Caribbean, yeah. West Indian. You go to this section, it's all like Chinatown, Chinatown Italy, it, old, yeah. you know, Little Italy. You got the poles over here, you got the people over here. So you had this cultural experience. I mean, for me growing up in New York, it was such a melting pot. Like I experienced everything. Like, honey, I could get down on some Irish soda bread and some corned beef and cabbage, and as much as I could get down on the cannolis and everything else, you know. So it's like, and the roti, I mess with the roti from the Caribbean. So it's like I've had all these things. That's like these memories of the city that was mm. so mixed and you go there today and it's gone why these How? people had the 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 older de generation they die the children they move out they sell their their homes their oh. apartments and all that stuff they move you have all of these corporations coming in and buying buildings and property oh, okay. you have all the wealthy coming in pushing yes. out all of the the poor people so now you have the city so you push out the cultures you push yeah. out the culture yeah. what you came there for you got rid of and now you want to sit around and complain about everything being so expensive you did that you know so, <laughs> old Thursday is a critic of capitalism, aren't you? So this is where you very step much in. am. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, good. All right. Well, God bless. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>